Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Humble pastor man is back in his cardigan. <clears throat> ready to enlighten you about what's really going on in the world. And with all of our beloved YouTubers. I thought, why not check in on all of our YouTube friends from the Roman Catholic world and see what kind of <clears throat> wonderful, mind-bending, logical gymnastics are at work. I'm talking about Olympic-level mental gymnastics. We're going to have fun. We're also going to check in on a couple things that I forgot about that I meant to discuss many live streams back <clears throat> was Cameron from Cucking Christianity. I mean, uh, Capturing Christianity. Interesting ch channel title. <clears throat> Why he converted to Roman Catholicism because you remember he made this video. And then we want to check in on our good buddy Carbohydrate Lofton to see what his solid argumentation was. We want to see what Trent Horn had to say about old Papa Frank and what was happening because <clears throat> I mean for me remember aside from Tim Gordon that whole sphere has been nothing but sass right I mean they've been nothing but vitriol <clears throat> and now they're in a tailspin because now they're whoa, 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 don't go orthodox <laughs> don't go orthodox and Trent's even having to turn to Ben Shapiro to help prop up the Boring Catholic Answers podcast. Now, I've noticed, but wait a minute. How are these channels growing given the mountains of absurdity and ridiculous argumentation that we've seen from all of these actors, except for, for one, except for our buddy Tim, who is honest. All of these other people, uh, to put it in the words of the Templar in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, you chose poorly. And now you have to <clears throat> cope and deal with the poor choices that you made. Because a lot of them literally thought that it was going to be a sufficient objection to the stuff that I've said and the arguments that Ubi and people in our sphere have raised for so long that it was just going to work to go after people on a personal level and do all the, the backhanded nonsense that a lot of people have figured out now, right? And I wasn't worried about this ultimately because I know and have been vindicated and it's been borne out <clears throat> that when you go down this track of the, the course the Vatican is set on, it will not correct. It will only get worse and worse. Because I actually know the forces and the powers that Francis is beholden to. And remember, to these normie people that we're going to be looking at tonight, except for Tim, they're all complete normies. They have no idea what the new world... They don't even know that there is such a thing. They've actually commented on it. Says it, they, they still think it doesn't exist. You've got people who promoted all the stab stuff. <clears throat> and they're even doing podcasts together, right? By the way, shout out to uh, Archangel Mike Angel... Archangel Michael Orthodox Church. Because they sent me a cool cup. You can go to their website uh, and support them. I think they have for a long time been big supporters and fans of the work that we do. So shout out to them. <coughs> Don't worry. I do have my cough drops on hand. <coughs> and uh, Father Zachariah Lynch and everybody at that church. <coughs> Uh, are big fans and supporters of the work we do. And we like the, we love the essays that Father Zechariah Lynch does. <clears throat> I can't even type today. So I'll give you, <clears throat> for those interested in uh, the Colorado region, if you're looking for an Orthodox church up there, 
<coughs> you can support them there. <coughs> they probably have a building fund as well. And so there's their church. If you want to support them. Uh, one of the few people who in the OCA, uh, well, I wouldn't say a few. A lot of the OCA does like what we do. But they actually underwent persecution for um, not going along with the COOF and for supporting the work that we do. And they're still um, disliked. So be sure and support them if you support the work that we do. Uh, t times are pretty tough everywhere. So um, you know, the point here is not to say that there's no problems in the Orthodox world. And therefore, we're right and you're wrong because we don't have any problems. The issue is, what are the problems? And are they problems of a systemic nature? Now, I strive <coughs> over and over and over on this channel to constantly demonstrate from the documents. We've got the documents, as Alex says, <coughs> to prove that <coughs> Roman Catholic dogma has absolutely changed. Even though, have you noticed of late that the typical, the classical Roman Catholic arguments that you always hear, they've been real quiet on those lately. Have you noticed that? Remember the classic argument <coughs> that we always hear is, well, we have the Pope to give us doctrinal certitude. That's Michael Lofton's favorite argument. Interesting how that tagline, that cliche, they've been real quiet on that one. They've been sitting on that one. How, how come we're not hearing all the advantages of the papacy giving us the certitude that we have? Even though a person from an epistemology 101 class could be able to tell you, that that doesn't work as a consistent argument to say that this the papacy actually grants you epistemic certitude just moves the problem back a step how do i know i'm interpreting the papal documents correctly <clears throat> and hence why i brought up basic epistemological challenges to trent horn in our debate and he had no idea what we're talking about didn't know what circularity uh, in terms of uh, foundational critiques was all about totally flustered totally lost but I more and more realize that this whole domain of these people is really just appealing to normies for just a low tier numbers operation. I've been overthinking a lot of this, right? And, um, you know, they get freaked out. I remember when Matt Fry was doing a, a streams with thumbnails where he's crying and that's because they're worried about losing their numbers and their audience, their market share. And in fact, I would venture that a lot of people's conversions might even relate to attempts to gain numbers. And that's why they're immediately funneled into <clears throat> the neocon normie uh, uh, Roman Catholic world which is not really the trad cat world, right? I would class Tim more so in the trad cat world. <clears throat> but Tim has enough of a basis in <clears throat> Aristotelian logic that he can recognize flat out contradictions and be honest about it. So again, we appreciate that. But the rest of these goofballs um, can't even do that. I mean, they're, they're not even able to do that. Remember when Michael Lofton wanted to do a debate, but he wanted to do a written debate? <laughs> yeah, okay, Boomer. Yeah, what what era is this? You want to do written debates? Like 2005 blogosphere? Come on, man. <clears throat> so I'm trying to convey to you guys, and I don't understand why you guys can't see this, that this whole domain of the normie apologists is a kind of a grift, right? And I get tired of people. This is overused now, right? Everybody calls everyone a grifter. <clears throat> but I mean, it makes perfect sense why Cameron would convert because it's a lot more, <clears throat> a lot more numbers and market share that you can get through these, these angles than you can with evangelical idiocy on YouTube, right? So why not enter into the domain of the mainstream Pope splainers? So nice market share there and it does look like these channels have grown right so 
Pints with Aquinas is up to 474,000. Trent is up to 111. So their channels are still growing. <clears throat> but have the, the arguments gotten any better? And when I read the comments of what's underneath these channels, I'm not surprised at just the overwhelming volume of just absolutely low tier um, sort of newbie normie takes, right? It's a lot of new people to, you know, people realizing, hey, something's wrong with the world. Maybe there is a God. Uh, what's the big churches? Oh, Roman Catholic. Let's look at this. And so they tumble down the rabbit hole of a bunch of these normie apologists, these pop apologists. But <clears throat> have the pop apologists actually made good arguments? Are they actually that good? Of course, the answer is no. Their arguments are terrible. Their arguments are intentionally kept at a super low level so that you don't go outside of their magic circle. <clears throat> and so they repeat over and over and over very low tier arguments because that is enough to gain a lot of numbers. So ironically, they're actually playing the evangelical game. It's not surprising, right? They're playing the sort of mega church model except now it's online right so the the model of the mega churches used to be like 10 15 years ago do whatever that brings the numbers in right <clears throat> and it worked <clears throat> to grow mega churches as a business model into these gigantic you know rock concert arenas you know smoke and mirror and all that stuff but the problem is that they learned as they did studies Pew Research and all that back in the day, like 10 years ago, that even though the number, the mega churches were bringing these giant numbers, they had a very high turnover rate. And they're actually losing as many people as they were bringing in. And the average <clears throat> stay behind, stay around rate was like some minuscule percent. And the average no the length of time was something like two or three weeks. <laughs> so the, <coughs> the mega churches would boast about having, you know, like, friends, we've converted over 40,000 people in the last month. And then a month later, 40,000 people left. Right. So yeah, I'll, I'll get to the challenges to debate here in a moment. Thank you for those uh, super chats. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so when it comes to the challenges to debate, <clears throat> and, 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 well, <clears throat> what I'm saying about the, uh, <clears throat> all right, got to have my, my damn cough drop because I still got the Vatican. I got the same throat aids from Francis from being in Rome seven weeks ago. <clears throat> Francis gave me AIDS. Give me a theological aid. <clears throat> I have already asked all of the people that you're asking me to debate. You think I haven't asked all those people to debate? Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> the more that I've studied and gone down the rabbit hole of the papacy in Vatican II, which is, um, I began studying that in 2003. Specifically, you know, Catholic theology and Catholic dogmatics. I mean, we've got more than one entire shelf of Catholic dogmatic works, not counting church fathers. I'm just talking about pure Catholic theology over here, right? That eventually got me into geopolitics. I mean, not Catholic theology, but the geopolitics of the Vatican, because that becomes more and more of an issue as you get deeper into history, as you get deeper into church, you realize, you realize wait a minute, the Vatican <clears throat> becomes a world power. <clears throat> and that seems to affect its approach to doctrine and theology. And if the Vatican is a world power and it, and it affects its theology, then we begin to see other explanations for why the Vatican is doing what it's doing. And so what we eventually get is different narrative accounts. So Trent would have a narrative account that the Vatican, is, the papacy is a, an infallible divine institution guided by the Holy Spirit, preserved from error. And when I encounter difficulties... <clears throat> 
I can go into the documents to try to make the system work. And here's my post explaining example. <clears throat> For me, I have a completely different narrative and account. And I don't even, I don't think there's anything at all supernatural about the Vatican anymore, other than it being essentially satanic, connected to all kinds of organized crime, the Vatican bank scandals, uh, inter, uh, the mafia, the CIA, all very well-known public scandals. People have been convicted over this. All the names are well-known. For them, that plays no role in the praxis of the Vatican and the papacy at all. They never mention it. And that's because they don't even know about it. And I'm not talking about going down some conspiracy rabbit hole. I'm talking about mainline history. If you want to call in, I'll open it up. You can call in right here on Twitter. X right here. And I'll open it up to people here in a moment. <clears throat> So that's, that's, and I think that narrative actually makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense why what Francis does actually echoes the same sentiments of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and Davos. But remember, Trent Horn doesn't even know about that, or he tells you intentionally not to look at that because there aren't conspiracies and it doesn't work and it doesn't matter. It's crazy. I mean, if you remember, Trent's initial critique was that I was the equivalent of a chick trap. So remember, to even talk about there being a new world order and the papacy being involved, even though Francis openly says he supports Klaus Schwab, that's the level of chick track. Now, I think that when we had our debate, Trent saw that, no, actually the level of debate that we are doing here is not chick track level. We've read through about 60 <clears throat> big fat Homes of the global elite. Do you think Jack Chick did that? <clears throat> Nothing to do with Chick tracks. So again, all of these people are literally relying on your ignorance and your low tier laziness to just accept their copes and accept their here, allow me to creatively invent something to make the system work. That's what they do. And anyone who goes beyond like baby tier stuff in theology or geopolitics. Right? Uh, pretty soon moves out of the sphere of these people. But these people know that in order to capture a, a sizable number of people and market share, they want to appeal to the broadest normie neocon con inc crowd that they can. It should do better if I do this. <clears throat> yep. I look at all the lovely people. Do, 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 do. I look at all the lovely people. Okay. We should be back. Hopefully it's going to, hopefully it'll even out. Now we won't have the interruptions, but I'll have to go back to the uh, LAN here in a moment. <clears throat> All right. Stream health says it's excellent. Well, that ended my, um, freaking. I'll have to open up another room if you guys want to call in because there were people uh, in line to call in here. So let me make another one of these. Has Catholic dogma changed? And it's interesting that there is this interesting connection between Daily Wire individuals and uh, the, the normie Novus Ordo world. They're all in a tailspin now trying to make all this work 
right? Because we've been absolutely correct in everything that we said would happen. So I've started a new uh, Twitter space here. If people want to join. So the new space is under the old space because the internet went out. Of course it would go out when I'm trying to do this stream, right? <clears throat> so uh, you'll have to join underneath that stream. <clears throat> so let's see what Cameron's arguments were. Cameron's arguments for why he left evangelicalism for Roman Catholicism. And as I was explaining before we had uh, the issues there, Cameron said that <laughs> initially, if I recall, this is my memory of the events, right? Cameron said, oh, <clears throat> Jay's, Jay's uh, uh, wiping the floor with Matt Dillahunty, right? And then later after the debate, when we had the fallout with him and uh, Inspiring Philosophy, he switches to, no, uh, actually, Matt Dillahunty mopped the floor with Jay. So that, this is a guy that says that Matt Dillahunty mopped the floor with me in that debate. That low tier, right? So just a, a seething, passive-aggressive, emo sort of character. Uh, I would say grifter man, right? Um, because the he also pushed the stabbies on you all. Has he said sorry for that, by the way? Has any of the, Have any of these people said they're sorry for doing that, by the way? And remember, I, I'm bad because I talked about conspiracies and told you about that, right? But all of these people pushed all this normie stuff and their army of normies still pushes all the same normie stuff. So I can only Im imagine that these are bad faith actors or grifters or just completely ignorant. But <clears throat> soon after that, a year ago or so, Cameron became a Catholic. Now, I wonder, are any of these people doubting their decisions? <laughs> Remember how bad, though. Remember how awful. And their, all of their argumentation was about me as a person. Nothing to do with argumentation. Nothing to do with the theology. Remember when Matt Fred said that he'd be open to inviting Ubi Petrus on his channel and then ghosted him? Of course, he wasn't going to have Ubi on his channel. Why did he say he would never have me on his channel? He just said, because I'm an evil, bad person or something. Why? Because I get heated in debates. And then he says to people coming on his channel, feel free to get heated and debate as much as you want. So again, it's all just hypocrisy. <clears throat> and so this goofus with this, Ridiculous, like, five-year-old haircut. I mean, like, literally, like, haircuts that were popular, like, what? Like, actually, like, seven years ago, right? This Diplo Spencer cut. <laughs> Let's hear why we're supposed to be Roman Catholic. Now, if I remember in this video, and I, and I just forgot to ever cover it, if I remember, his, his argument was that he, he ran an algorithm or something in, in, a, in some sort of a calculator that told him that uh, it was highly unlikely that... I mean, let's see what he said if he used this stupid calculator argument. ...for a document that I could, like, say, okay, yeah, here's this piece of data, here's this piece of data. I, I created a, the, what, what I call a Bayesian like analysis of the, all of the evidence for and against the papacy. And so I, I use the Bayesian framework because I think. <clears throat> yes, I know I had to click the stupid thing to make the sound come on for you. So he had just said, yes, it is a 
an algorithm based on Bayesian analysis. So, so he came, right. We're supposed to believe that he's like, I guess, I guess we're supposed to think, oh, he's a genius mathematician. And so he's going to prove the papacy with mathematics. Uh huh. What's the Bayesian analysis of butt stuff? Can you get a, can we get a Bayesian analysis from Cameron about the legitimacy of blessings of butt stuff or, or not? Full variety, right? And so the fact that he was impressed with that and then you assigned what? Points to each line of evidence for so, and against? So what I did was I, I created a, what, what I call a Bayesian like analysis of the, all of the evidence for and against the papacy. And so I, I use the Bayesian framework because I think that it's a more formal way of doing like... I mean, is this not like the ultimate sort of Spurg approach, right? I mean, maybe they're just trying to appeal to internet Spurgs with this argument. I'm going to put all of the pieces of evidence into a spreadsheet. We'll call this the QuickBooks. Cameron's QuickBooks analysis. Remember QuickBooks? For the papacy, right? Cameron's quick books argument for the papacy. I put all, I put all of the arguments into a spreadsheet. How do we even know you're putting good arguments in there? Well, I'll, I'll link the spreadsheet below. You could go through it and deduct the mathematical uh, quantification of the argument. This is ridiculous. A Bayesian spreadsheet argument for the papacy. You can't make this up. This probably has what? 31,000 views. At least it's not 300,000 views, because this is utterly ridiculous. Everyday probabilistic calculations that you do on your, in your own, like in your head. And it- yeah, everyday probabilistic calculations that we do in our head. I mean, do you sit around doing everyday probabilistic Bayesian calculations in your head? Did you ever consider that that might be an argument for the papacy? But how is it an argument for the butt stuff? That's that's what we want to know next, right? And I'm sure we're going to get some amazing explanations as to how it doesn't mean what it says it means in paragraph 31, right? You're like, okay, how likely is this event? And you'll say, oh, it's really likely. That might be some, you know, some example that you would just come up with. But uh, in in Bayesian terms, like what you'll do is you'll assign a figure to that probability. And so you can be a little bit more precise Mm. in seeing like, okay, well, how much of an effect probabilistically does this piece of evidence actually have? yeah but what's the probability of the ding dong touching the other ding dong in the roman catholic blessing services right what's that probability i would say it's 98.9 percent probability of butt stuff um but again i i just cameron did you figure in that into your equations please let me know as opposed to just going on the sort of more informal Okay, this is some evidence. Here's yeah. some evidence. Here's some evidence. Here's a lot of evidence. Here's a lot of evidence. How but many, then you know, but then you don't really know at, at the end of that how it all combines. How many lines of evidence did you have for and against the papacy, roughly? There weren't a lot for the papacy. There was the biblical. Ah. There, there were the biblical arguments. I see. And but there's a lot of Protestant objections. There's a lot of pieces of data that Protestants <laughs> what, say. Wait so a minute. I, what? I, I would say a, like. So there weren't a lot of arguments for the papacy, except for the biblical arguments, of which there are none. At least the Vatican I papacy is nowhere in the Bible. There is the successor to Peter via having the keys argument, which is an orthodox argument, sure. But a Bayesian spreadsheet that... Now it's getting ridiculous, and I actually think this is a bunch of actual just total BS flim-flam. He put into his Bayesian spreadsheet mostly anti-Catholic arguments. And he still comes out of this. I mean, I smell total grifter here. Counts, counting them up, I probably had like four for the papacy and about 15 wow. against the papacy. And, and it seems to me that what's interesting about this analysis is that rather than going on your kind of intuition, yeah. you're, you're, you actually don't know what the evidence is going to show yeah. you. Because yeah. you're, you're going, going through them one by one and assigning a number. This is... <laughs> Who would fall for this? Let's say I got to see these comments so people actually think that this would be a good argument. This is a brave man. Are you serious? Who in the who did Cameron ever actually debate? I asked to debate this dude. All, I mean, I immediately wanted to debate this dude when he had a falling out with me, and all he did was post all the DMs trying to make me look like a bad man, right? Which is what they do. Which. If, if I actually was a bad man in the DMs, I don't care, right? Because I'll post a DM if you're talking a bunch of bull crap to me. Sure. 
But what happened was they wanted me to not, I kid you not, <clears throat> they wanted me to have a debate but not say anything mean. And I'm like, I'm not going to su subject my free speech to your arbitrary deciding. I don't know what you think is mean. Because debates include rhetoric. And if I utilize rhetoric, which is a central part of debate, I'm not going to submit to your evangelical uh, arbitrary, that's mean, it's not pious. So I said, no, the debate was already agreed upon. You introduced a new criteria that I cannot be mean in the debate, which is just ridiculous. And uh, I said, no, I wouldn't concede to that because we had already agreed on the debate terms. <clears throat> and then he said, oh, well, uh, then there won't be a debate and I'm going to leak all the DMs and make you look bad. Okay, yeah, good job, dude. Good, right. So I guess it kind of worked in that people still think that I'm mean because I wouldn't agree to their arbitrary decisions to not be mean. I mean, do you guys understand what this is the crap that I deal with? And, and then it's like, dude, come on. Just do the damn debate. We've already agreed to it. Now, ironically, Inspiring Philosophy and I already made up and we don't care about this anymore, right? So we let this go. <clears throat> uh, haven't heard from this guy. Don't expect to. Don't care anyway. But the, the, the ignorance of these commenters. Roger says, this is a brave man who never failed to debate any Catholic. Uh, what solid Orthodox person did he ever debate? And is is nobody in the question, the comments here, even remotely questioning his Bayesian algorithm for the papacy that he just made up? I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah, here's at least one solid commenter here. Both sides, as if orthodoxy doesn't exist exactly. But look, orthodoxy <coughs> isn't necessarily going to give you a big market share. So did anybody consider that that might have had something to do with his decision, right? I mean, these comments are just ridiculous. As ridiculous as the the QuickBooks argument for the papacy. All right, I got to hear more of this. This is gold. I, I, I didn't even, I forgot about this, this, <coughs> this whole thing here. I, I'm glad I went back to this, right? <clears throat> now he's going to have to have a Gazian argument for the papacy, <laughs> Uh, thank you. Shout out to uh, William in the chat, right? Because we need to know the probability. What was the probability in uh, 20, when was this? A year ago? 2022 uh, of the legitimacy of butt stuff back then? Well, I would say it was 98%, right? According to the Gaysian algorithm. Yeah. And so what I did at the beginning was I wanted to be charitable to both sides. Again, I'm trying to fight my bias. So I'm trying to be charitable to the Catholics. I'm also trying to be charitable to the Protestants. And so what I would do is I would assign I'm a charitable number. Oh, he assigned a charitable number. number. So this is like utilitarian calculus, right? Where This is like Jeremy Bentham's argument for the papacy, right? Which actually works. I could see Jeremy Bentham making an argument for the papacy because Jeremy Bentham was an outright PEDO, right? So Jeremy Bentham would have made a great... Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham should have been the Pope, I mean, being an open PEDO, right? We get a straight up uh, Pedosian analysis, right? To go, to go to 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 Rome. <clears throat> what are they sitting up on a <laughs> on a balcony in, outside of St. Peter's? <laughs> this is ridiculous. So again, <clears throat> I'm glad that it's charitable, and I'm glad that he assigned the charity number to the various arguments. Yes, you heard him right. He assigned charitable numbers. To what's the charity? Is that like a seven or a six or maybe a six, six, six? Maybe that's the most charitable number that we could ascribe to the papal arguments, right? I mean, <laughs> this is this is Jeremy Bentham's moral calculus argument from um, Cameron Bertuzzi. To each of the, the pieces of data and be like, okay, well, yeah, how likely is this? Eh. Like, let's give the Protestant something here. And so we'll give him a little, like, this is a little bit of evidence against the papacy. Can't really say that's a whole lot, but this is still being charitable. And so, but what you can do with the, with the Protestant case is you can. By the way, I forgot. <laughs> I just re remembered. This is the guy who hates the transcendental argument, by the way. 
which I think is literally just too high IQ for him to get. He just doesn't get it. And that's part of the reason it makes him mad. And that's why that's the real reason that he insists that I totally lost the debate that Matt Dillahunty wiped the floor with me, according to Cameron. And I think it's because he just can't get tag. He doesn't get it and no idea what it is. And so you're getting the most ridiculous evidentialist argument I've ever heard for anything in the religious world. I mean, Jeremy Bentham's moral calculus argument is dumb and completely like internet spurred Coomer man level stuff. But in a naturalistic atheistic universe, I can at least see why Coomer man Bentham would make that kind of an argument. If that's the universe that he lives in and we're all just machines determined by this giant, you know, mechanistic universe, we're all in this dirt <coughs> in the machine. Welcome my son to the machine. But to make this argument in some evidentialist stack up the arguments in an algorithm for the papacy is so dumb. This is preposterous. So no wonder Cameron Bertuzzi would never debate anything. I asked this guy multiple times. Okay, you think I'm dumb? You think Matt Dillhoney wiped the floor with me? How about you come on and we'll have a debate? Oh, you're mean. I don't have to. I got an excuse. You're mean. So remember, the excuse is he's mean. Meanwhile, <laughs> he's got a quick books argument for the papacy. Accumulate all of these different lines of evidence. So they've got the Didache. They've got these different documents, these early church documents, where you don't see, like, the papacy clearly laid out in specific names. Why is Matt Frad smoking a cigar on top of a... in front of the Vatican? Are we supposed to think that... Like, I can be some, like, some sort of, like, Australian James Bond in Rome. He's like, he's trying to do pull a Daniel Craig. Like when Daniel Craig goes to the Vatican, <laughs> like, he's trying to be like the Aussie James Bond. Oh, I'm here on a mission for Pope Francis to make sure the world accepts the quick books, gazy and argument for the papacy. By the way, he sounds like, he sounds like the guy who sells you shit in resident evil. <laughs> Hi there, stranger. Like to buy a little bit of butt stuff? Welcome to Vatican City, stranger. You might need some pendants to ward off the satanic evil inside the Vatican. <laughs> got a news. Got some items for sale, stranger. Literally the dude that I was just talking to in Resident Evil. All right, that's Matt Fred. We well, don't see like the papacy clearly laid out and specific names and everything. And so they'll say... This is a document we would expect mm -hmm. to find the papacy in this in this early this early document, and so in it. But there are obviously Catholics who want to respond to that, like Jimmy Akin, and be like, "Well, no, there's actually reason to suspect that they wouldn't have named sp specific names in the early church because." Does Jimmy Akin respond to that while he's doing his Star Wars streams, or is it after the Star Wars stream? So, because I can't I can't remember who like as an actual like Star Wars soy man, right? J. Dyer is worldly. Johnny G, would you like to come on the chat and debate? So again, I, I sense I sense a Roman Catholic in the chat. I sense a Roman Catholic in the chat. Now, if I did a Star Wars stream, it would be to make fun of it. It would not be because it's cool. Resident Evil actually is cool, though. Who would have ever thought that Resident Evil would be more based in Chad one day than Star Wars would be? And yet, here we are. If you remember when Resident Evil 5 came out, they were already trying to cancel it because they said it was racist. Resident Evil 5 is racist. Anyway. Hey, Jamie. Yeah. Could you make me a coffee? I don't know if you heard me or not. <clears throat> uh, you have a gift for impressions. Thank you. I did impressions for my entire high school my senior year. I think I do have somewhat of a gift. Maybe one day it'll be really good. Anyway, this is too funny. I, this is better. This is more comical than I ever dreamt of. Why? The church was being persecuted. So you're not going to just spell out all the names of the most important figures in your religion so that people can just read the letter and then go hunt them down and, and kill them. And so there's, there's reasonable, like, responses to that but nevertheless i was still being charitable to the protestants 
and giving it some some weight of evidence against you would papacy. think if you have around 15 arguments against the papacy and only four yeah. in favor of the papacy that it's got to be hard for the papacy to come out on top unless those four arguments are very strong yeah so there's there's really three passages in the New Testament that are sort of relevant to the the papacy in terms of like giving some positive boost to it which is Matthew 16 John 21 and Luke 22 and you if you look at the Interesting. So <clears throat> I like the admission there that there's really only three passages that we build this entire edifice on and allow me to explain via intense eisegesis. If you don't know what eisegesis is, that's where you read back into a passage, something that was never there initially or in the minds of the author. Eisegesis is very common when people <clears throat> like to bolster a new doctrine via <clears throat> mining the passages for something that was never there, but then creatively constructing an argument. For example, allow, allow me to start, let's say I started a cult, right? <clears throat> and my cult was centered around the idea that <clears throat> instead of having a male patriarchal tyrant or even a female run things, the fairest type of governance should be kids. Kids rule. Kid order, dude. Shout out. Hashtag kids rule. Now, why would I want kids to rule? Because there's a passage in Isaiah. It says a child shall lead them. Clearly, that's talking about the true head of the church should be a, a teen, dude. Teen pope. Thank you. I mean, the passage says a child shall lead them. The Pope is the leader. Clearly, that's saying we need a kid Pope. By the way, a teen Pope would be better than Francis. <laughs> I mean, let's bring in Pope Joffrey. Put Pope Joffrey up in there. He'd be better than Francis. Dude, Joffrey, didn't even, Joffrey wouldn't be making people, uh, you know, sign on to the, to the bootay stuff. But the passage says that a child shall lead them, and all the passages are about the Pope. Isaiah 22, the steward, the steward, the steward of Gondor, he's a symbol of the Pope. For Gondor! Right? Remember Seen Bean? Remember Sean Bean? The steward of Gondor basically is the Pope. Him over there, right? He's over there suckling on them berries with meat giblets running down his face. But hell, I'd rather have the steward of Gondor as the Pope than Francis. Who would y'all rather have? The steward of Gondor or Joffrey? Either one would be better than Francis. Because neither one of them, and they were corrupt, but they didn't make anybody do butt stuff. For Gondor! Fugador! Right? If the steward of Gondor was Pope, then you'd have a, a Boromir over there. Who's Joffrey? People don't know who Joffrey is. Right? You'd have Sean Bean over there going, Fugador! Come on now, that was pretty good jokes. That was alright, right? Right? Those three, you'll, you'll see, see that, that I, I, I mean, mean I, I think being charitably, you can say, okay, this does give a little bit of weight to the, the side, side of the papacy. papacy. Is this a buzzword that him and Lofton all just decided to suddenly hammer everybody with being charitable? Well, being charitable, being charitable, being charitable, being charitable, 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 charitable. charitable is this, this thing to beat people's heads over with uh, as some sort of lame, like one time over blanket excuse for everything, right? What do you even mean being charitable? I mean, I know what the word means, but what do you mean? Because I feel like it's getting overused here, right? But what really surprised me... Yeah, exactly. I legit would have a hard time choosing between Francis or Pope Denethor or Pope Joffrey. Like, it could go either way. This is why I spend so much of my time focusing on this one piece of data. Is there's uh, Or it's just a ridiculous grift argument that you thought would 
dupe a lot of dummies into thinking that you had a mathematical Bayesian proof of the papacy. <laughs> I mean, who actually believed, did you guys believe, who believed this? A Bayesian spreadsheet argument for the papacy? <laughs> I mean, is this dude, tro maybe he's trolling. Maybe Cameron is actually super Bayesian. Bayesian. I'm going to give you a Bayesian spreadsheet right now from QuickBooks as to how this argument is tarted. <laughs> a Bayesian spreadsheet for the papacy. I remember when I, I remember when I saw this video a year ago, I was like, is that real? <laughs> and I totally forgot about it. I'm so glad I remembered this thing. This is a, this is a gem dude. Um, <laughs> I want to remind y'all because we got a bunch of young boys in the chat. <coughs> <coughs> we got a bunch of young boys. Does this even exist anymore? Didn't Bill Gates put this on everybody's computer back in the day? I want to see a 90. Here we go. Check this out. This is what we're talking about right here. Creating invoices really quick, especially with Jarvis. Oh, not this crap. For those that don't know, and you want to, would you like to construct your own? Bayesian argument for the papacy. Allow me to show you QuickBooks. Just install <laughs> Windows XP <laughs> or whatever they had in 1997. I mean, <coughs> what do we have in 1997? I don't even remember. Uh, so for those that don't know, here's Windows uh, QuickBooks 1997. QuickBooks accounting software from the makers of Quicken. I called a toll-free number and got a free trial version. My system works fine for me. <laughs> That's what I thought. But if you have bills to pay or customers who owe you money, you really ought to try this. Yeah, or if you have apologetic work that's super lazy and dumb and grifty and like kind of a joke, you can also use QuickBooks. Or a religion that would like to easily make dumb people convinced. <laughs> <coughs> I think Vatican City is Mordor. So what are y'all talking about, right? M Mordor or Backdoor? <laughs> y'all tearing it up in the chat. It's on fire tonight. This is the quick book. This is the Pope Francis edition right here. You get a, you get a, remember, <clears throat> remember in uh, Microsoft Word, that little clippy, right? You get a little, you get a little, uh, a little dollar sign with a, with a, a papal, with a Pope hat that pops up and helps you out on, on um, Pope books. Now, quick books, what do we want to call it? I'm trying to think of the right word. Microsoft, Microsoft Pope Splainer. Microsoft Pope Splainer. By the way, you could literally write a program for this crap. The Microsoft Pope Splainer program, like QuickBooks, type in your problem, and it will spit out a Gaussian uh, algorithm based on Cameron Bertuzzi's calculations, and you'll never lose an argument. Yeah, but does it do the Vatican Bank's payroll? Because that funds a lot of organized crime and uh, money laundering and weapons trades. Remember how it came out that all the weapons sales that were being funneled to Vatican bank accounts. So does QuickBooks work with the Vatican bank or is that a separate private bank? So that's probably, that's probably off the records, right? Never have to answer information twice. There's, There's over 50 customizable reports that put you in control. Know if you're making or losing money. So every Roman Catholic pop apologist should head on over here and get QuickBooks because Cameron solved the, I mean, who knew you thought you had to do all this boring ass apologetic work, read all these books. You only needed one book. QuickBooks. This argument called the typological, the, I, I, there's, there's all sorts of names for it, but the typological Eliakim argument, you can sure. you call it something like that. But there's a connection, there's a textual illusion. Ah, you see. Three passages that have nothing to do with Vatican I. And now let's move to the Eliakim typological argument of the steward of Gondor 
right, is somehow equal to the Kwisatz Haderach, the God Emperor on Earth. I'm going to remind you of what this doctrine actually was in history, because all of these goobers don't even talk about it, and they don't even know. Like, I can't stress to you how low tier normie pop apologetics for the Roman Catholic world actually is. And I know because I was in it and I did it for a while when I was dumb. Before I learned about QuickBooks. <laughs> I'm going to show you another change that nobody ever talks about except over here on this channel. No one talks about one of the biggest changes. That, by the way, was backed up in part via the stupid eisegesis of what he's talking about. The, the steward, Eliakim, is Christ, first of all. It's not a worldly office of Peter that mirrors a worldly steward in the Old Testament kingdom. I mean, they're literally like going back in time to Old Testament relations to try to make the papacy into the equivalent of an earthly high priest, which would be a version of Judaizing heresy. It's just so stupid. I mean, by this type of argument, everyone in the Old Testament who is the leader of anything is now a type of the Pope. You see how stupid this is. Now, let's get creative with our eisegesis. Oh, well, we had some female judges, didn't we, in the book of Judges? I think her name is Deborah. Oh, oh! To quote Beck. Remember Deborah? Why, Deborah was a type of the Pope, you see. She was a head of Israel. The New Testament needs a living earthly head. The Pope should be woman. Oh, but wait a minute. That's a violation of papal code, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really, is it? You mean like how... Blessing unions was a violation. Oh, but that's changed. But it didn't. But nothing changed. Ain't a damn thing changed, dog. Ain't nothing changed, dog. Yo, ain't a damn thing changed. Why doesn't he have... He should have a rap song about that, right? Loft dog. Ain't a damn thing changed, dog. Ain't a damn thing changed. By the way, we're gonna, we got an awesome clip of Michael Lofton lying. <laughs> so we'll play that just in a second. How many times did I tell you these guys were just complete goobers? Number one, they're actually not that smart. It, the lack of, the reason they're not debating with me has nothing to do with me being mean. And by the way, th all of these people, except for Tim, are totally passive aggressive and totally cunning and shifty in the background. So they present you this pious case, a face. And in the background, they're not pious. These people are ridiculous. Now, maybe Trent is. I don't know Trent. <clears throat> so, but I, the rest of these goons are goons. And we're seeing that they're goons because <clears throat> I'm not wait. You're talking about Jay's being. I'm not wasted. I think I'm wasted. This is normal me, dude. I'm not wasted. I did take chalk today, so if I'm ramped up, it's because of chalk. But I'm not wasted. In fact, I'm never wasted. I do not. I never, ever drink. I know people are surprised when they hear that. I had one glass of wine for the first time in five years when we met the uh, Italian uh, uh, Strozzi Giocardini family, the nobility. And I did that because they have a winery and I didn't want to be rude and not drink their wine. But Jamie can tell you that <laughs> I hate alcohol and I don't drink. And I quit drinking. We're coming up close to a decade, dude. Like, we're getting up towards a, a decade. I just, I don't like alcohol. I quit liking it, like, almost seven, eight years ago. Just woke up and I was like, you know, this sucks. I don't like it anymore. And by the way, I drank enough in my 20s anyway. And every time I tell this story, they're like, you were an alcoholic. We got him exposed. I think I could have become an alcoholic if I had constantly kept drinking. But no, I wasn't an alcoholic. I never went to AA or any of that stuff. I just one day woke up and said, you know what? <clears throat> I don't get much work done when I drink. And it's not fun anymore. Once you get to about age 30, you can't drink like you did when you're in your 20s. And you wake up feeling like crap. And you are you feel like garbage for three days in a row. It's like, all right, I'm done drinking. And then 
<clears throat> by age 30 anyway, all your friends are married and have kids and they don't go out to bars anyway. So are you just going to drink at home alone? That's, that's freaking losery, dude. Anyway, <clears throat> we got to get back to Cameron. This is too good. Uh, this is, by the way, thank you for the super chats. Much appreciated. Uh, we are going to get to Trent and we're going to get to Loft Dog. And uh, is that it? <clears throat> Oh, there was a, 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 a Scott Hahn clip here. So I think uh, Cameron, yeah, it gives me heartburn too. By the way, when I quit drinking, all my acid reflux went away. So people are always complaining about acid reflux. Oh, go get my acid reflux. I'm going to take all these pills. I'm going to take Zyrtec and blah, blah, blah. I'm taking all these alien planet names. I got to take Zyrtec. From the planet Pleiades. Look, why are you taking alien name pills, dude? You want a big secret? Stop eating cake and drinking alcohol and you won't get acid reflux anymore. <sighs> Revelation. <clears throat> All right, this is too good. This is comedy gold. 16, 19. And Isaiah 2222. Which talks about the office of the <clears throat> By the way, if somebody would actually like to see a complete deconstruction of this dumb argument from Isaiah 22 of Eliakim as if it's a proof of the papacy, there was the classic debate on Suan's channel with Ubi, uh, and I don't remember who he debated. Maybe it was, it was Suan, wasn't it? <clears throat> the new Eliakim, and, and the funniest thing about this debate, I'm not kidding. If you go, if you really want to go watch it, is that Suwon ends up going into uh, quoting elements of the Talmud to prove how Jews viewed Eliakim and the. I mean, so I, I love that. I mean, let's go to the Talmud to to prove the earthly temporal supremacy power of the papacy. Yeah, exactly. Again, demonstrating that the real essence of the papacy is a step back into. Old Testament methodology and ideology when what Jesus was setting up was not an earthly power and kingdom. That does not mean, and you guys know I'm not a Baptist, right? I'm not some kind of goofball that thinks that this, the state has no role. The dual headed Eagle is the role. Okay. The dual headed Eagle <coughs> doesn't fit anywhere into the papacy because if the he the Pope is the head of church and state, then it's a single headed Eagle. <laughs> Not a dual headed Eagle, but everybody knows that the classic image and symbol of the church from the patristic Byzantine period is a dual headed Eagle. <clears throat> I'm not lit. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm chocolate. If you're talking about lit, I'm on chalk. I'm not on any drugs. I ain't lit. And it's a textual allusion back to this Old Testament character, Eliakim. And so the argument goes is that Peter, that's mentioned in Matthew 16, 19, is the fulfillment of Eliakim. Mm -hmm. So he is the new Eliakim. He's the type. That's, that's the, the typological. Yeah. Interesting. You notice that <clears throat> for the first thousand years of the church, as far as I'm aware, <clears throat> Isaiah 22 is never used as a Vatican I style proof of the papacy. Naturally, it would only become a creative exegesis or eisegesis after the Gregorian reforms, after the 11th century when we get the papal revolution. Shocker, right? You think any church father exegeted Isaiah 22 <clears throat> as a proof that the Pope has not just universal jurisdiction, but also that he has temporal supremacy. And I'm going to show you that that's where the doctrine goes. Because none of these people ever talk about the dogma. The audio of what is too low? I'm, my audio is too, too low or his? <clears throat> Let's see if I can turn Cameron up any. Turn it up. Bring the noise. All right, we got Cameron up as far as he'll go. Let's see if that helps. <clears throat> Let's see if we can try one more thing to make it even. That's about as loud as we can get it. So, let's see. Because they don't talk about the fact that the temporal supremacy of the Pope, 
became a dogmatic definition that was necessary for salvation. <clears throat> you see. And I'm going to have to freaking turn the dang internet. I'm going to have to turn the dang Wi-Fi on. Because the battery is running down. Time to grab another cough drop. And to remind you to smash that like button. <clears throat> Support the show via super chat function. If you have a question, comment, topic, feel free to bring it up. <clears throat> I was inspired today. <clears throat> yes, I literally, I have the Vatican. Somebody said, are you sick? <clears throat> I've had Vatican cough since I was at the Vatican seven weeks ago. Where I was smoking cigars on, on the balconies of the Vatican. Psych. I would turn down smoking cigars on the balcony. Of the Vatican. It actually sounds like some kind of. It actually sounds like some kind of <clears throat> Skittles rainbow meetup. Let's smoke some cigars on the balcony of the Vatican. If you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, it's a bit fabulous. <clears throat> All right, let's get back to the Bayesian proof of the papacy. Oh, this was about yeah, Isaiah 22, Eliakim. It's fulfilled in Christ. has nothing to do with a temporal papal ruler. Between the Old Testament character, the, the New Testament character. And what you do then is you see that the office, the Old Testament office, is going to be very similar in all sorts of ways to the New Testament office. Not, not in every way. Obviously, there's going to be, because the new, the, uh, Jesus' kingdom was greater than David's kingdom, there's going to be greater properties that are going to exist in the anti-type the yes. the type that you see yeah, the fulfillment that you see in the in the new testament so it's not going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two but you're nevertheless going to see some correspondence and so if you look now you might think well now wait a minute surely when we object to this and point out that this is creative eisegesis and nobody in the new testament thought of isaiah 22 as a reference to a temporal papacy with universal supremacy and jurisdiction in all scope. And the, the Kwisatz Haderach doctrine, surely, right? The universe is super being. Right? Surely they have an, a response to that. <clears throat> what do you think the response is? High IQ, beloved audience. And I'm not trolling. My, my audience actually is high IQ. We don't fall for these dumb QuickBooks arguments for the papacy. <clears throat> what do you think the response is? Doctrinal development. Ah, yes. The great umbrella Ubermenschum argument, right? Well, you see, it wasn't necessarily immediate there in Isaiah 22 or in the patristic exegesis for the first thousand years. It's a doctrine that developed where we learned the seeds coming to full fruition of the papacy to become the temporal ruler. And how exactly was the temporal authority of the, pro, the of the Pope backed up for many, many centuries? Oh, the forgeries, exactly. Mm. Were the forgeries also seed doctrines contained in Isaiah 22? Well, you see, there's a development and then it takes time to, to, to weed out the bad. Oh, okay, interesting. So it's taken time to weed out the bad arguments and the bad reasoning as to why it's wrong to bless Skittles unions, you see. You see that Doctrinal development is the same basis for moral development, dummies. What properties Eliakim's office had, then it was very close to the papal office. And so then the question is, does that really transfer over? Does that office transfer over to Peter? And so I was, I was not convinced about this argument for... A while, but what I saw. <laughs> so even he knew this was a stupid argument, right? But what was the thing that changed his mind on this Isaiah 22 argument? I got to hear this. Was that if this argument is true, and again, I was trying to be charitable to both sides. If this argument is true, it is so unlikely that Protestantism or orthodoxy is true. Again, this is this is the distinctive doctrine is the papacy and so basically it's like <laughs> now wait a minute this started out as a quick books bayesian argument of some sort of algorithm 
some sort of sus algorithm that he came up with. <clears throat> and now he's decided that Isaiah 22 is the linchpin. Of all arguments, this is the linchpin. Again, please go watch uh, Ubi's debate with Sawan Suna on this stupid ass argument. This is so dumb. I can't believe that people think this is the clincher for the papacy. I mean, how are people, fa how are people falling for this? I'm trying to figure it out. I do remember the first time that I heard this argument back in maybe 2005. I think I heard it from, it's from, it was in the Butler Dahlgren and Hess book, which is a popular Roman Catholic apologetics book, Peter and the keys or whatever. I got it over here. And I remember <clears throat> thinking, interesting. That's a fascinating argument. That is a, a <coughs> interesting take. But I was not very well studied in the book of Isaiah <clears throat> at the time, nor was I really good in New Testament theology either. So I have to think that this could only be a convincing argument to really low tier, low information voters. That's all. That's all, all I can think here. Because, I mean, in Suan's case, it took him going to the Talmud and digging up ridiculous, out of nowhere, Jewish tradition exegesis, eisegesis, inventing stuff about Isaiah twenty-two and their view of the high priest or something. I mean, just crazy stuff <clears throat> that would have nothing to do with the praxis of the church, obviously. If you've got Peter, he's got these papal-like qualities with his office being the new Eliakim. How likely is that on the papacy? Seems pretty likely that we would find... So, <clears throat> interestingly, he just stated the thing that was in question. So you've got Peter who's got these papal-like things in the office. That's what he said. That's not me making fun of him. You've got Peter that's got these papal-like things of the office. Let's hear this beautiful eloquent, wonderful statement again. And so basically it's like, if you've got Peter, he's got these papal-like qualities. If you've got Peter, he's got these papal-like qualities. Well, that's the thing in question, Cameron. So you notice that it's not surprising, by the way, that this is also the guy that can't get tag. He doesn't, he can't understand tag, literally. And so he doesn't understand that your presupposition is that Peter equals Vatican one. <laughs> and that's not what, what's been demonstrated. I guarantee, I guarantee you 100% that this guy hasn't read Vatican one, much less any of the other councils. With his office being the new Eliakim, how likely is that on the papacy? Seems pretty likely that we would. Um, is no one going to talk about how Eliakim is a type of Christ? The very office and the statements of Eliakim and what he does is the thing that Christ has. So in the Lyakin passage, it does state that he's the he will open and close, right, as the steward of the house of David. And remember when we had the debate with a certain Catholic and the book of Revelation came up and the quote where it says, I have the keys of death in Hades. And this certain Catholic person said, that's Peter when it's Jesus talking to the seven churches. Do you notice the pattern there of type and fulfillment, type, anti-type? Things that are typically referred to as fulfilled in Christ and in his ministry, the person of Christ, are transferred consistently from Roman Catholics to the Pope. Now, to be fair, we would agree that you could say that every bishop and every priest in a way, also represents the Father and represents Christ. It doesn't follow from that 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 becomes then a retroactive proof of Vatican I's claims. Oh, that should be so obvious. And their own church in the Alexandria document admits this even more forcefully than the Chieti document. But of course, they haven't read that because this is all relying on low information voters who haven't read the documents and don't know what all this stuff actually says. 
We did a whole live stream going through the entirety of the Alexandria document. Do you even know what that is? That's where they admit all of our positions again. Again. Under a papally approved commission. Me, David, and Snack right here. We put the whole thing on the screen for you because you're all lazy and won't read it, Roman Catholics. And every Roman, I remember when this came out, what, six months ago? I posted this. I sent this to every Roman Catholic I could think of. Do you know what I got in response? Silence. Silence. Absolute silence. No one responded. Remember that tri cap mom that would call in to the streams and talk for an hour? She said, oh, uh, uh, I'll watch this later. Silence. By the way, <clears throat> Have any of the Roman Catholic apologists commented on the Alexandria document? How come? Where's the Pope explaining on the Alexandria document? Now, maybe they have, because I don't watch these goobers, but if they have, feel free to enlighten me and put it in the chat or something. We can, maybe we can go watch it. But, I mean, here's uh, the Papal Commission admitting about 90% of the Orthodox complaints and arguments. And guess what? If that's true... Then Vatican One's not true. Fred says, I've watched a lot of you and I find you hard to follow. Well, ask a question. What what is hard to follow? I mean, how how many are how difficult is it to understand that Unum Sanctum says that you have to believe in the temporal supremacy of the Pope to be saved? And now that's no longer Roman Catholic dogma. Post Vatican II. The Pope took off the triple TR. Do you know what that is? Do you know why he took the triple TR off? To signify that he no longer cares about, supposedly, some temporal supremacy. The triple crown symbolized that. And Roman Catholics no longer confess that post-Vatican II. So, that's a thing that was necessary for salvation in Unum Sanctum, but you don't have to believe anymore. Do you want an easier example? How about Urban II calling a crusade versus now you can go and pray in the mosques with the Muslims. How about that? Is that clear enough for you? Do, you, does, do people not have any discernment to understand that you can't, as a Christian, go pray in mosques towards Mecca? Do you not know this? W what kind of Christianity, what do you even think this religion is? And do you understand that the trad Pope Benedict did the exact same thing? And do you know that the Pope's planners never tell you this because there is no explanation for this. Except that it's just simply an apostate religion that's a tool of geopolitical power. But remember, there's no such thing as a new world order. So that doesn't exist. So problem solved. <laughs> I mean, why are you falling for these people? Uh oh, it's a liberal publication. Oh, so it didn't happen because it's a liberal publication. You can go find it in a thousand publications. You can't, as a Christian, pray in a mosque. Because it's a public sign of defecting from the Christian faith. In Roman Catholic theology, it's that. Moral theology tells you that. Does this not make it clear for you that that's a different religion? Is this the same religion that Urban II believed that called for a crusade against the godless infidel Turks? Is building an Abrahamic faith center the same religion? And it's not just Francis. What's that Francis? No, you mean Benedict? You mean like right here? Trad, Bayes, Trad, Benedict going and praying in the mosque towards Mecca.
He's just praying silently to Jesus. That's called casusdry. Casusdry. That means that you justify obvious moral infractions with Pope splaining. And Roman Catholics are notorious for this. This is a surrendering of the religion. Because it signifies by the action that you are giving credence to, blessing, just like their Skittles blessings. You're blessing, you're affirming that Mecca is a site of God. And that the mosque genuinely worships and has a connection to God. And that is not Christian teaching. Islam is an Aryan anti-Christ religion. They completely reject the deity of Christ and the Trinity. And they, everyone knows this. Is that clear enough for you? Is that clear enough to signify that this is a different religion? <clears throat> so we had one trad cat the other day saying that, oh, it's not a change because... It's a change in practice about how we operate with Muslims. No, no, no. You understand you can't go and worship publicly with other religions <clears throat> in your own theology. You can't build a Abrahamic faith center together with Muslims and Jews. Unless you actually do have a false religion that is the same God of Muslims and Jews, which is essentially not the Trinity. So actually, it is more honest for Francis, Allah, Vatican II's natural theology to build an Islamic faith center and a Jewish faith center together with his Vatican II faith. That is more honest. And they do worship the same little G God together, which is not the Trinity. So all of you in communion with Francis are partaking of that spirit. And that is a spirit of delusion. And it's odd, again, yeah, exactly. Why does this even need to be explained to a person who per, persons who profess to be Christians? <clears throat> what are the what are the what are they saying about do the tra do the Catholic apologists even talk about this? I mean, are they not telling you that this exists? I mean, so <clears throat> here it is. Oops. We're not playing London grammar. So remember, according to Trent Horn, this should be absolutely okay. What's wrong with because we have in common, supposedly, with Muslims and Jews, the worship of one generic God. That's natural theology. So there's nothing wrong with an Abrahamic faith center because, as Vatican II says, we share the same God as the Muslims and the Jews, even though they're not Trinitarian. So <laughs> we don't. But, I mean, <clears throat> Trent shouldn't have a problem with this. Maybe he doesn't. Lofton, all these idiots... So <clears throat> here they are all at this Masonic looking ceremony and they're bringing their cubes of light, which is all very ominous here. Bizarre, ominous thing. And this is, this came about from Francis's joint declaration with the grand Imam for you Pope splinters out there that are ignorant and trying to say, well, Pope Francis didn't have nothing to do with this. It comes from his document. Of course he has something to do with this. And have you all forgotten this? Did you forget Pachamama? Did you forget the Amazon Synod? Did you forget all these Francis greatest hits? But remember, the papacy provides certainty, epistemic certainty, doctrinal clarity, moral support, and guarding of and maintenance of tradition. Remember, that's what the Tradcats and the Pope Splainers and all these 
Roman Catholics have been saying for years. Oh, but they're, they've been pretty quiet on that one, haven't they? Remember, they were quiet on this. They're not using this trump card of the papacy making everything clear anymore, are they? How come? How come? Well, because nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. Oh, if nothing changed, then why did Francis have to issue a new document? And how come the they're all going wild with it, with their Skittle stuff? Nothing changed because the document says in one paragraph, nothing changed. Oh, yeah, that's called double speak. That's called a contradiction, as even Dr. Ed Fazer pointed out about the document. So, wait a minute. I thought Francis's documents make things clear and they're the final court of appeal. But no, no, you need all the pop Catholic apologists to interpret the interpretation of the interpretation. What would Francis do without Michael Lofton to interpret the, the papal documents? Yeah, right. You have to interpret the magisterium. But wait a minute. The magisterium was supposed to be the final court of appeals. Why do I need Michael Lofton and all these papal apologists? If the magisterium is the final court of appeal, why do we need them? Why do I need a th an army of Pope splainers? And by the way, the Pope splainers themselves now have their own mini army of Lofton splainers on Twitter. But let's let's finish uh, Cameron's Bayesian quick books argument for the papacy. This is the stupidest stuff I've ever heard. Find that scripture, but, but then, then you, you flip, flip around if you're doing this Bayesian analysis, and then you ask, how likely is that data? given something other than Catholicism, something other than the papacy, so like Protestantism or Orthodoxy, how likely is that data? And I, I just have, have to say, say... I just have to say, now, the whole question is, do these texts actually prove the Vatican I doctrine of the papacy? And his move is to just basically say, well, look, let's have Peter with all that papally stuff, all that papally qualities, papally qualities, he said, papally, papish qualities. And then how likely is it that orthodoxy or Protestants could explain these texts? Not very likely, so there you go. I mean, this is a, the dumbest sleight of hand, stupidest argument. I've ever, this is the crowning dumb argument for the papacy of all time. It is dumber than all of the like, It's this is dumber than a forgery. <clears throat> like a forgery is a bet. I mean, because it's at least kind of cunning, you know what I mean? But this is just l Looney Tunes, dude. Looney Tunes. Thinking about it charitably, again, it's, it's got to be, be super, super, super low. low. It's got to be very, very low. I see. And so this, this is really strong. <laughs> Even Matt Fraser, uh, huh? I, I see. I mean, it's that, by that little giggly I see there, it's almost like maybe even Matt Fraz kind of doubting. This is like, yeah, this is a little, this is a little goofy here. This is, I don't know if I, I don't know about this. How do, you, how do you do it, stranger? Could I sell you a better argument? <laughs> our, our resident evil merchant. Evidence for for the papacy if you're convinced of the typological. I see. Argument. So if you're not, it doesn't do much damage. Well, that was an interesting admission. So if you're convinced of the typology, then it's a great argument for the papacy. <laughs> so in other words, grant me my papal presuppositions, and then we can read into Isaiah 24 or 22, all the Vatican I stuff. Wow, amazing how this is a strong argument. But if you are, it's, it's very, very convincing. convincing. Is that what you're saying? Um, there's a caveat there. So... I was going to wait to talk about that a little bit later. Let me. Do you mind if I pull up my oh, of notes course. and see if there's anything that I've missed? And just while you're doing that, just so for, for those, those who aren't aware, aware, when we talk, talk about, about typology... typology does QuickBooks run on an iPhone? So I'm confused here. So he's trying to pull up his QuickBooks. Uh, <laughs> does it still run on, on Mac operating system, I wonder? You're referring to persons, places, places, events in the Old Testament um, that foreshadow a greater reality in the New. So St. Augustine says... The New Testament is concealed in the Old. The Old is revealed in the New. And this is not some medieval invention. St. Paul talks about Christ as the new Adam. Um, and there are many other examples. examples. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what are, yeah, nobody doubts typology. But your creative eisegesis 
of reading Vatican one into Isaiah 22 is, is just ridiculous. That's what people doubt. Not, not typology. Notice he doesn't even think his audience is like intelligent enough to even know what that is. Right. So again, this is like, let's speak to the lowest tier of people who have no clue about anything and rope them in with this mathematical Bayesian argument for the papacy. This is just unbelievable. A uh, Catholic philosopher I had on the channel recently said that Christianity is a typological religion. And this is one of the things that's really give me, given me like a, a, a better appreciation for the Bible is the fact that the New Testament ties in mm. to the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of the mm. Old Testament. It's not as if, I mean, as a Protestant, my, my view was kind of like, oh, we could kind of like get rid of the Old Testament. Like, Let's forget about it. Let's try to forget about it. Because you, you have, have these problematic Old Testament passages about the... Well, that's interesting because that runs counter to uh, the type of approach that the Vatican put out on its uh, the document on the relationship of the church to the Jews. Remember that document? Because it actually said that rejecting typology is a valid way to read the Old Testament. Remember that? That was a huge scandal. All the Roman Catholics were in an uproar for years over this document. <clears throat> um, what was the name of that document? It's, it's, it's escaping me at the moment. The church's relationship to the Jews. It's not Nostra Tate. It's a document that they put out in the 2000s because even people like Jimmy Aiken and even the, all the normie Catholic, even they had to try to explain this thing away back in the day. Can anybody remember the name of that document? I haven't thought about this in a long time, but actually if you read Ratzinger's book, he basically says the same thing in his book too. Two religions, one covenant. Excuse me, many religions, one covenant. It's a real book. I know none of you noob Catholics have read this. But I've actually read about six or seven of Ratzinger's books. And uh, Ratzinger refers to the document in this book. I mean, even Ratzinger's book was kind of a scandal. Because it says that the Jewish reading of the Old Testament is a valid reading. Oh, but that would mean that all the prophecies of Christ as the Messiah and all the typologies are also uh, no longer the case, you see. So just classic Vatican doublespeak. People ain't here talking about Russia. Russia doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about tonight. No, it's not Nostratate. They It's a separate document in the 2000s that came out. Let me see, maybe it's mentioned here. It's something like <clears throat> this, uh, the relationship of the church to the Jews or something like that. It caused a big stir. They all tried to downplay it. They all tried to downplay it. Like even uh, EMJ, he says stuff like, uh, oh, this document it has been canceled out. It doesn't matter anymore. Oh. And when, and when did the Vatican do that? Exactly. It's just, they just say this stuff, right? Oh, well, we don't care about that anymore. I'm sure you don't because it's pretty, like, it's pretty contradictory, right? Does nobody remember this document? <clears throat> Let me think. <clears throat> All right, it'll probably be in this article here somewhere. I'm trying to think what the name of it was. Now, it might have even been a document specifically put out by the U.S., like the, the American U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And the document came out, maybe even the 90s, it was either the 90s or the 2000s. And it's one of these things that people have forgotten, like the joint declaration with uh, the, the, the Lutherans. 
I mean, the joint declaration with the Lutherans is another example of contradiction because Lutheranism is uh, an infallibly condemned heresy. And the joint declaration says that, uh, well, that doesn't really apply anymore. <laughs> okay, sure. I mean, Lutherans still believe Lutheranism. Oh, it, maybe this is it. This is back to 2015. New document doesn't seek for conversion. Yeah, it had all kinds of stuff in it like this. Maybe this is it. Oh, come on now. A damn pay article? Come on. Let's see if we can cheat. The Catholic Church does not seek to convert Jews anymore. The document says, yes, this is it. What's the document, though? It's not Nostratate. This is a post-Vatican II document. Hmm. That's not it. I want to find this because everybody's forgotten this. Here, here we go. Everybody's forgotten this. I didn't forget it. Let's see. New document. Jew, uh, Catholics should not try to make converts. None of these doc none of these things say what the document is. Oh, the document is called the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Here we go. Bingo. This is it. <clears throat> Aha. That's it. So this was a document that was put out uh, on the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate of Vatican II. And it specifically says that the Old Testament is a valid, there's a valid way to read the Old Testament that Jews have. Uh, we're not going to convert Jews anymore. It's all just totally like surrendering the entire mission of the church, right? I'm trying to see what year this came out. 2015. Mm, I think there's actually an older document in 2015. But here is that document if you want to read that one. I mean, there's a ton of these, by the way. Oh, here we go. We should just go here with relations with Judaism. So basically, there's a bunch. I'm not sure which one it is. So let's see. Commission. Documents of the Commission. There was a specifically notorious one, though. And um, it prompted all the Roman Catholic apologists to go into overdrive, hyperdrive, to make it work. Do we have any former trad cats that remember this? The address to Mainz. No, that's not it. <clears throat> you can find it on EWTN. Hmm. It just seems like... So, I, I thought Gifts and Calling of God document was older. But I mean, the covenant that God has with Israel is irrevocable. Uh, that's actually, I mean, God says he will divorce Israel. It's simply not true. And Roman Catholic dogma actually says in the Middle Ages that the covenant of the Old Testament is no longer in force. I think it's a, I think that's at Cantate Domino at Florence. 
So this is just an outright contradiction right there. But remember, these are papally approved dialogues, right? And of course, they're all just going to say, oh, we don't have to listen to that. Yeah, but the Pope has approved these documents. Even if you don't like it or you don't listen to it, the Pope has, has approved it. So this is what he this is what this is what he thinks, right? He agrees with this. So that means that he doesn't believe the Christian faith. Cardinal Koch. And by the way, if Francis disagreed with these documents, he would simply say, do not follow these documents. I am the supreme teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church. These documents are telling you not to make converts of other religions. And that is a uh, horrendous evil action because to make converts is an action of love. Anyway. If you really want to, though, I mean, there's a whole host of these documents here. If you go to the uh, Vatican's website for ecumenism, and all of the documents are right here. So here's it's actually a giant trove of them. <clears throat> and uh, the joint declaration with the Lutherans, I'm sure, is also on here. Oh, there's too many documents on this thing. You have to go fish for it if you want it. But anyway, there's the link. Uh, let's get back to Cameron here. Remember, these documents say to not make converts. Right? You remember how Lofton was saying that Francis never said that, by the way. I lost my place. Where are we at with the uh, QuickBooks here? Cain and ice and bears attacking children. It's like, let's, can we just forget about the Old right. Testament? Can we just yeah. like forget about that and just focus on the New Testament because it's this all about is, love uh... and... The Marcion heresy, isn't it? It's not a new... Well, it's something that I was just sort of like drawn to, yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, unconsciously. Yep, yep, yep. I was like, I wish that I could just do away with the Old Testament. Yes. yes. Because then it would just like... So yeah, but Benedict also says similar things, uh, like when it comes to modernist exegesis of passages too. So, I mean, the Vatican has adopted higher criticism and higher critical methods, uh, at least pre-Vatican II and then pretty much dominates in the Roman Catholic world. So they're trying to sell you on this, uh, you know, classical patristic exegesis when the Vatican has already accepted modernist higher critical exegesis and doesn't do typology in their seminaries anymore. So he could say, well, but I'm not, I'm talking about at the church level. Yeah, but the Vatican promotes the modernism that you're critiquing. So I'm talking about the head of your church level. Oh, this is especially in your debates with atheists. It's like, yeah. I've just put yeah. to one side. Yeah. I feel like it wouldn't be as embarrassing. By the way, keep in mind, his debates with atheists, this is the uber-evidentialist man. It's not, it's not accidental that he went to Rome, isn't it? Because evidentialism is bound up with foundationalism and bound up with foundationalist epistemology and natural theology. So interesting that it's very telling that he went to Roman Catholicism. I love that. Yeah, it's but like then technology saw, helped me see the importance of the Old Testament and how important it is for the New Testament authors, including Jesus. Jesus went through and Luke all the Old Testament scriptures and was like, "Yeah, this is Moses had to do this and all that." And that but wait a minute, Cameron. If Jesus went through Luke. And told them that the Old Testament was about him, and all those passages were typological to Christ, his, to his ministry. And that would mean that the Old Testament is not validly read by the Jews, which the Vatican says it is. So, so I, you're going against the Vatican there, Cameron. Did you know that? And so it's, it is a typological religion, Christianity. Would, so. would, would you mind if I pressed back against this? Maybe try to play devil's advocate with this, or would you sure. rather me not do that? Um, well, I, I, let me. Do you mind if I just Please. continue the, the journey? So at this point, I did start to look into this one argument. So it, because I saw if this argument actually works, then it's really powerful evidence for mm -hmm. the papacy. And so then I wanted to, to actually, actually study it. And look. Yeah, so again, accept all my presuppositions, and then I'll overwhelm you with this wowing eisegesis passage from Isaiah 20. So I thought he started with Bayesian <clears throat> quick books. And now we spent the last five minutes on Isaiah 22 as the killer, kill, the kill shot papacy argument. <clears throat> Into it a lot deeper. And so <clears throat> as I studied it, I continued to remain sort of agnostic about it. I continued to just see, I mean, yeah, like this argument 
I, th there are good reasons to think that it's successful. Right. But then you hear objections from Gavin Ortland, like uh, typology run amok. Right. And like, that seems like a good objection. Yeah. I don't really know. Aren't what to you do just with reading that. into this? How yeah. is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, <clears throat> for example, we should expect to see in the first 800 years of the church anybody, any council, any church father utilizing Isaiah 22 about the papacy. Right? Wouldn't we expect to see that if this was so obvious? And has anyone shown this? I mean, again, perhaps there is a church father somewhere that utilizes Isaiah 22 <clears throat> in some typical... I've never seen this. I would be surprised. Perhaps it exists. Um, do you want to come on the stream? So we got a bunch of people in the chat. We got 800, 900 people over here in the chat uh, making a bunch of fuss. So you can call in. If you're going to fuss in the chat, just come talk to me. Call in right here via Twitter. Otherwise, stop fussing in the chat. I'm talking to the uh, post planners in the chat. <clears throat> so yes, Marco, JB, come, come to the uh, to the chat here. Because we're going to go, we'll go to more documents. We got all the documents you want. I'll, I got papal documents out the wazoo here. Oh, you don't know that. And, and so, so I remained agnostic about it. And so I was, uh, but I was talking one day with a, a friend of mine who's an expert in, in uh, Bayesian analysis. And I was like, so what do I do at this point? Do I, do do I, I just like. like oh, so wait a minute. <clears throat> it's not actually Cameron's argument. It's his friend that's an expert in Bayesian analysis that's going to give us the QuickBooks Bayesian proof of the papacy. You can't make this up. This was the dumb, this again, worst papal argument of all time. A piece of data? Or what do I do with it? If I'm not convinced about this, da this data being an actual data point, do I ignore it and then just like go with whatever the other evidence that I've got? And he was like, no, you don't ignore it. What you do is you cut its probabilistic force in half. If you're unsure about mm. that piece of data, then you cut its probabilistic force in half. And so naturally I went directly to my document and I did that. And the probability after I cut the, the probability in half came out to 0.91, I think. It was, it was <coughs> All right, I've had, <coughs> I've had about enough of this, this argument. This is, this is, we've got to move on. I mean, so 0.91 chance that the that Isaiah 22 is not about the papacy. Okay, yeah, and that's why you're a Roman Catholic. Good luck with that, and we'll see how long that lasts. Um, I imagine it could last infinitely because uh, these people, it's like Dullinger said, right, that once Vatican I happens, the entirety of Roman Catholic apologetics would become papal lawyerism, meaning that everybody would no longer defend Christianity, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, all that. It would be now to defend the, the papacy in Vatican I. What did 99% of the papal apologists do? Argue the papacy. And so Trent, uh, someone reached out the other day and said, <laughs> it wasn't for Trent, someone was reaching out independently of Trent, said, why won't you have the Trent debate? We had a Trent debate. What are you talking about? No, the papacy. Oh, I have offered twice to off to debate Trent on the papacy because I think that the papacy is a geopolitical power and institution under the sway of things like the economic uh, World Economic Forum and the State Department. And Trent had no interest in debating that. Trent will only debate the topic of the infallibility and inerrancy of the papacy as a institution created by Christ when that debate has been had about a million times. <clears throat> and so how many times do we have to see the same proof text, the same quote mining? I mean, it just gets old. That debate has been, Ubi has had this debate with every one of these Catholic apologists already. So I want to know, because the, the papacy has a tremendous amount of geopolitical connections, there have been countless public scandals in court cases. Can somebody please help me understand the meaning of those things? Because that actually seems to make a lot more sense to explain the papacy than your Pope's planning.
but they will not debate that. Why will they not debate that? None of them. I have reached out to professors. I have messaged everybody who has Catholic scholar friends. I've asked all of them, somebody please debate the geopolitics of the papacy. Not one of them will touch it with a 10-foot pole. Because remember, according to Trent, there aren't conspiracies. It doesn't, I'm Jack Chick. That was literally what he said. Literally, the, 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 the I mean, <laughs> sure, right, right. I, I'm Jack Chick. I wrote 60 plus writings of the elite we've lectured through. I'm Jack Chick. Uh-huh. But I'm telling you, they won't debate that topic because I will demolish them because even their own trad cats write gigantic scholarly tomes and go on their buddies' channels to talk about geopolitical influence and control of the papacy, like David Wimhoff, the lawyer. And so if I've read that book, it's like 800 pages, and he goes on Flanders' podcast and all these people, and I talk about the same stuff, they call that crazy conspiracies. When the very guy who writes the book goes on people in their circles podcast, meaning they support by a proxy crazy conspiracies. This is, it's so ridiculous. None of these people want to have a serious debate about real on the ground world issues. They want to already have you debating fan fiction infallible papacy nonsense <clears throat> so I'm talking about probably the last two years I've asked specifically to find Roman Catholics that would debate the geopolitics of the papacy and there are, there are none I've gotten a resounding no from every one of them and I've even reached out to guys I don't even know I've never heard of like I've, I've asked Tim I said T tell me the scholars Tell me the papal historians that can explain to me the Vatican banking scandals and the P2 Mafia and Gladio. Nobody. And again, have any of these people ever even talked about those things? No. They don't even know about it. And they have the gall to call me Jack Chick. So I want to hope that maybe Trent just doesn't know about those things, right? But I can guarantee you this, <laughs> if we did have that debate, not one of these goobers would last five minutes, would they? And they know better. That's why they don't have it. And the excuse that I mean is an excuse. So that's it. So let's see what Trent's explanation is. And who does Trent go to? Interesting. Ben Shapiro. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the, the Council of Trent, Trent Podcast. Podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers Apologist and Speaker, Trent Horn. I wasn't planning on talking about the issue of the new Vatican document on blessings for same-sex couples and couples, couples in irregular, irregular situations. situations. <laughs> he wasn't planning on talking about it. I wonder why he didn't want to talk about it. Maybe because it's another big contradiction, Trent. Is that why, or is there another reason? Because, because a lot of other voices, voices were addressing it. it. But, but Ben Shapiro Sh asked me to come on to his show to give my perspective so I thought this would be a good opportunity to discuss this issue and the Catholic faith in a broader way. Well, I'm curious, Trent, did you abide by the Vatican documents that tell you to not to try to attempt to convert Ben Shapiro? Did you stick to that or did you want to try to convert him because you know that deep down that's what Christians do is they try to convert people? Or were you faithful to the Vatican's apostasy telling you not to convert uh, Jewish people? To, to his, his audience. audience. In the interview that I had with Ben, which I'll share with you shortly, I wanted to communicate that some reports about this new Vatican document are simply not true, uh, like reports that the church has changed its teaching on marriage, or that the church is now, now allowing for formal liturgical blessings for same-sex couples that resemble gay weddings. That's not, not true. true. The church, church is not changing. Um false the church has changed because the responsum 
of 2021 about the blessing of same-sex same couples was what? What did the CDF say in 2021 about the blessing? Do you remember the word? For this reason, it is not listed to impart a blessing to these relationships. Did you notice that he cha- that he cleverly said sacraments in marriage? No, no, no. We know that it's not sacraments in marriage. It's the blessing, the priestly blessing of the couples. 2021, can you read? Response them, 2021. Holy Office of the Inquisition, can we do butt stuff? If we're on our way to do the butt stuff, but we're also sorry for it, but also we're not, and also please bless us. Yes, yes, please give us this. CDF, no, it is not listed to impart the blessings. So you just heard Trent say, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Oh, but wait a minute. What does the new document say? Paragraph 31. Fiducia, can you guys read? Within the horizon outline here appears the possibility of blessings of couples in irregular situations and for the couples of the same sex. Oh, but, but it's not liturgical. So what? Stop with the sophistry. Trent and Michael Lofton are liars because the document clearly is a change. What does the document right here say? For this reason, it is not listed. The Vatican's doctrinal office, the CDF, in 2021. The other day. Blessings are possible. You are being lied to. These people are liars and they are forced to lie because they are bought into a system that they are coping for with their mental gymnastics when it clear as day says a change. Not licit can now be done. Can you read? Can you read? Stop lying, all of you lying liars. Do you know what their response is? <clears throat> Can you guess? Oh, but in the earlier paragraph, it says you can't do it. And nothing. the earlier paragraph says nothing changed. Oh, so if there's an earlier paragraph saying nothing changed, and then a later paragraph says that you can now do this, that's called a contradiction. And even your famous professor, Dr. Ed Fazer, went on Twitter to show you that that's a a contradiction. So you're lying because it is a change. And if nothing changed, there was no need for a document because the CDF had already said you can't do it. Right here. And that has always been the teaching back to the 2003 document from Ratzinger that we covered last time. So 2003, you can't do it. 2001, can't do it. 2023, you can do it. And all those Skittles men immediately started doing it. So you are liars. Trent, you're lying. Matt Frad, lying. Actually, Matt Frad. Now, wait a minute. Does Matt Frad differ from Trent Horn? Because why is it Matt Frad saying, well, nothing changed? Maybe he is. Let's see. Episode, Episode of Pints of Aquinas, Aquinas, you might say. I, I want to say big, big thanks to Trent Horn for letting me use his studio. I want to read what the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, the church of which I am a member, just had to say about fiducia supplicants. So, so we'll, we'll read through it together. Which, by the way, is a church basically run by the CIA. So if you don't know, I mean, the Ukrainian uh, Catholics are were big involved in trying to split the Orthodox Church in the Ukraine, which, thank God, has failed. It did lead to, basically, the uh, persecution of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Uh, but the thing he's touting that he's all... Because all by the way, all these Roman Catholic pop apologists, they don't go to the Novus Ordo, by the way. You know that, right? They're all involved in the subversion of passing themselves off as LARPing Orthodox because their State Department-run churches are basically all about that. 
So that's another element to this that people don't know, right? So he's basically saying, I go to the Fed church out of Ukraine and let's convince Orthodox people as I wear Orthodox t-shirts and present myself like I'm Orthodox, but I'm trying to trying to get everybody in union with Francis. Hey, stranger, got some new wares. It's, it's a very, a very short, short document, document, but quite, quite powerful. powerful. So, communique regarding the reception in the UGCC, that's the Ugre uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, of the declaration of the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith for Ducia supplicants on the pastoral meaning of blessings. In response to numerous appeals from bishops, clergy, monastics, ecclesial movements, and individual laity of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church regarding the declaration of the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith for Ducia supplicants on the pastoral meaning of blessings, and after consulting with relevant experts and competent institutions, I wish to inform you of the following. And there's four short paragraphs. Here's the first. The above-mentioned declaration interprets the pastoral meaning of blessings in the Latin Church, not in the Eastern Catholic Churches. It does not address questions of Catholic faith or morals, nor does it refer to any prescriptions of the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, or CCEO, nor does it mention Eastern Christians. So their clever out is that, oh, we don't have to listen to it because we're under another canon uh, law, Eastern canons in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, have you read Vatican I? You have to accept Vatican I if you're a Roman Catholic. You don't get to not accept Vatican I's teaching about the universal jurisdiction and supremacy of the Pope because you're in an Eastern Rite. This is a fiction that Eastern Catholics have made up to make Eastern Catholicism some offer and some opportunity to Orthodox people. This scam has gone on for way too long. People that have watched David's video begin to figure out that it's LARPing because there's nothing in Vatican I that gives Eastern Rite people some excuse to not have to, to, not have to submit to the papacy. The papacy, when it speaks on faith and morals, is authoritative. That's his ordinary teaching. So Michael Lofton is actually more consistent than these people because Lofton understands what Vatican I says about the ordinary teaching of the papacy meaning that you have to follow it. You don't get to go to a national group of churches. Look at what these guys are doing. How long have they said and critiqued orthodoxy? Orthodoxy is nationalistic. Now he's going to a nationalist church, the Ukrainian Catholic nation state church. He's repealing to a nation synod of church to be more correct than Francis. That's not how papism works, Matt. Vatican I doesn't allow you to pick and choose Eastern rites that aren't subject to papal rulings. Now, you might think you can do that, and you might think the papal system allows for that. That's just the incoherence and contradiction of the papal system. That's not true Eastern synodal praxis. That's called orthodoxy. So he wants orthodoxy within papism, which is the whole scam of Eastern Catholicism. And he's going to, oh, I'm going to side with a bunch of bishops in a nation state against Francis. That's called schism. Have you ever heard of nation states going against the Pope? In papism, that's called schism. Have you ever heard of old Catholics? So these people have no concern for consistency. They have a, ministry of grift that they've erected over the last several years and that's why they won't ever debate anybody who's serious why have a debate when you could just keep this nonsense going thus on, on the, the basis, basis of canon 1492 of the cceo this, this declaration by the way i'm skipping this because eastern canons have absolutely nothing to do with this the eastern catholics pretend that they're not governed by the pope and that they're governed by some mythical Eastern canon law, which is not subject to the Pope. Now, I'm not saying that canon law is mythical. The idea that they're not under the Pope is mythical. Vatican I says anyone who does not accept Vatican I is excommunicated and damned. So for you to say, I don't have to accept Vatican I because I'm an Eastern Catholic and we're governed by our own canons. Your canons have nothing to do with the Pope's overruling and supreme universal jurisdiction. And by the way, that's proven by the fact that 
the Pope determines what the Eastern canons are. This is so stupid. This is all deception. They're coming up with creative ways to lie to you because they're liars. Cannot be separated from the rest of the copper priests always has an evangelical and catechetical dimension and therefore can in no way contradict the teaching of the Catholic Church about the family as a faithful, indissoluble... Oh, but wait a minute. So, if, But I thought there was no contradictions. I thought nothing changed. If nothing changed, then why do we have to listen to the Ukrainian Catholic Church disagreeing with the document? But remember, nothing changed. These people are in free fall. They're frauds. They're liars. And they have to repent and turn from this. But they won't do it because of pride. I hope everyone can see how ridiculous this is. And these are the same people who have dissed me, come after me, same people who try to get me deplatformed, all the skullduggery that they've engaged in, lying about me, coming up with nonsense for years. And the last, we haven't made a stream like this in years, right? We did a, a Lofton stream two years ago. I don't even pay attention to these people. So don't come over here and be like, oh, you're all salty. Why do you have such a bad attitude? Dude, I don't, I, don't, I don't pay any attention to these people. But I will pay attention to them when some big scandal comes out, which is a contradiction, or Francis completely changes whether it is morally appropriate to bless people engaged in what they call mortal sin. And it changed. And Trent just flat out lied and said nothing changed. But now if nothing changed, why is this guy having to side with people that say that the document's wrong? And fruitful union of love between a man and a woman, which our Lord Jesus Christ raised to the dignity of the holy sacrament of matrimony. Pastoral prudence urges us to avoid ambiguous gestures, expressions, and concepts that would distort or misrepresent God's word and the teaching of the Catholic Church. The blessing of the Lord be upon you, Sviatoslav. Right, so this LARPer who pretends to be Orthodox is knowingly going against the teaching of Rome, siding with a national church. Guys, remember how, how many thousand times have the Trad Cats said, Your church fails because it's nationalistic. <laughs> As if Roman Catholicism isn't, by the way, completely nationalistic throughout Europe and many countries, right? Now we're supposed to listen to the Ukrainian Catholic Nation Church against Francis. Matt, you were selling people on the papacy and its ability to provide clarity, unity, and certitude. But wait, now we're supposed to listen to the Eastern Ukrainian Catholic bishops. Well, but that's orthodox. That's not papalism. So that's about enough of that. I'm not going to play this nonsense of him trying to explain this for an hour. All right, let's listen to this because this one was gold. This is pure gold because, of course, the Pope's planner uh, in chief, Michael Lofton. What does Michael Lofton say about this and does he contradict himself? that the blessings which he also extended to remarried couples could take place in churches in the diocese of spire the ceremony must differ from a church wedding ceremony in terms of words and signs and should explicitly now here's a kicker reinforce the love commitment love commitment and mutual responsibility in the couple's relationship as an act of blessing he so for context, this is just uh, a month ago when German bishops were saying that there could be a blessing for sames, for, for unions, for Skittles unions. And what was Michael Lofton's argument? It violates the magisterium. The very thing that this do new document says can be done. Do you see this? So let's listen to him. You can hear himself. You can hear him yourself. As I said, um, you know, some people disguise certain things in very cunning ways. I mean, I like Francis's documents. Here's how they're going to try to sell it. 
they're going to try to sell it as, well, we're not blessing sin. Oh. Anything disordered in this union. By the way, this is the very thing that this liar now uses to Pope Splain about the document. Do you hear this? The very thing that the document that he's critiquing a month ago says is now what he says. We're just blessing whatever good is found in this union, such as monogamy, commitment, friendship. We're just blessing the good found there, not the bad. The very thing that Francis's documents tout. The very thing that the armies of Nova Sordo people are now doing to explain Francis's document, Michael Lofton in this video says, is the trick they would use. This liar uses the tricks now because he's a fraud. He's a liar. You see the way that they're going to try to couch it. And in fact, we're seeing him couching it in just that way. And you've, you're probably familiar with what my response has been to that which it's exactly what the magisterium actually said in response, um, as we'll look at here in a moment. Oh, right. So magisterium within a month develops to be the opposite of what it said a month ago, according to you. So now we have the opposite on the blessing. The magisterium has developed within a month. My response has always been, <clears throat> you can't isolate any good that you find such as fidelity and commitment, you can't isolate them from the context in which they are found. We can speak of commitment, fidelity. Dude, uh, Jokel in the chat, Joker in the chat. I already addressed this stupid objection. It does not say, th the document literally says, it is. Can you read? You're sitting there saying it doesn't say what it says right there. And all, I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, but in another place in the document, it says that nothing has changed. That's called a contradiction. Jokel, what does it say right there? And what did, if nothing changed, why do the Ukrainian bishops say that it's wrong? What do you mean nothing changed? You're just lying. It's called a contradiction. Look at this. What does it say? For this reason, it is not licit to impart this. This is 2021. And then the new document. The new document says what? Within the horizon outlined here appears the possibility of blessings for couples. In irregular situations of the same sex. It literally says it right there for you. And you are lying. And you can't, either you can't read or like battered wife syndrome, you double down and look to the other places in the document where it seems to say what you want and ignore the part that's a contradiction. So tell me how it's not a contradiction. Jokel. And by the way, why don't you call in? It says only people can be blessed. It says couples, 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 couples. The document is on the screen for you. Look at the Roman Catholic lying in the chat. As the document is on the screen. What does he say right here? It says that only people can be blessed. The headlines, all the media lied about it. No, Jokel, you're lying, Joker. The media did not misrepresent it because it says couples, couples. It's even in the headline of the section. How do you lie right there to, to everyone's face? Are you gaslighting us? Do you think that we can't read? It says couples. Are you running a Capturing Christianity, QuickBooks, Bayesian analysis, which tells you that couples just means two individuals. Is that how you make it work? This is why your religion is collapsing, because you're lying to yourself. You're liars. Couples is a neutral term. A neutral term. Was it an, oh my gosh. 
He. This is his cope. Couples is a neutral term. Doesn't even make any sense. A neutral term. The freaking term was <laughs> in the old document. It said you can't do it. Was it a neutral term then? You are a liar, dude. Just boot this liar. These people are unbelievable. And this is why your church is collapsing because you can lie all day long to yourself. But guess what? This empire of lies isn't going to work because Francis is doing our work for us, joker. Get this liar out of here. I'm so sick of these people. I'm putting out with these people for years. Look at the level of lying that these people resort to. Just made up some nonsense. The word couple is a neutral term. What does that, that doesn't even make any sense. A neutral term? These people are disgusting. That's why, why do you get so mean on the left? Because these people are disgusting. They act ridiculous. They lie all the time. And they pretend and present to everybody that they're pious. Like Michael Lofton's big giant crucifix. Got a big giant crucifix behind my head, dog. Look how pious I am. By the way, buy my new rap EP, dog. <laughs> Listen to this liar again with his nonsense. This blessing, whatever good is found in this union, such as monogamy, commitment, friendship. We're just blessing the good found there, not the bad. You see the way that they're going to try to couch it. And in fact, we're seeing him. I mean, for you utterly super slow people. Let me explain it. This is Michael Lofton a month ago explaining when the German bishops in his in his organized crime sect that he worships in, when they wanted to do union blessings, Michael Lofton is saying it's against the magisterium and he's even picking apart the logic they use. Now, in Francis's document, they're doing that very thing. And so he's contradicting himself. Hopefully everyone can see this. And if you can't see this, then just go somewhere else, man. Don't even come to these streams because I don't want you to be here. You're not, this is not for you. Go lie to yourself elsewhere. Go have your Pachamama and your voodoo elsewhere. Go do your butt things elsewhere, man. We don't want you here. This is not for lying liars who want to delude themselves. You could, there's, go to Michael Lofton's chat. That's where you should be. You should go buy into his grift and provide him with more donuts and go download his ridiculous, horrible rap songs. By the way, I can, I'm can i a, a joke rapper better than he is. Couching it in just that way. And you've, you're probably familiar with what my response has been to that, which it's exactly what the Magisterium actually said in response, um, as we'll look at here in a moment. My response has always been, <laughs> <clears throat> you can't <clears throat> I see any good that you find such as fidelity and commitment, you can't isolate them from the context in which they are found. We can speak of commitment, fidelity, friendship, isolated, objectively speaking, these are goods, right? But we isolated. live in reality. We don't live in the world of ideas, Plato's ethereal realm. Why are all the papal apologists contradicting each other? I thought the papacy provided clarity and certitude. And yet all of the pop apologists are all having different takes and contradicting it. They're, they're melting down, bro. This system is itself melting down because the system itself is a geopolitical power structure in reality. In reality, you'll find what's going on in books like this. 
not in Trent Horn's apologetic pop books, but in books that show you the history of the papacy becoming a world power and becoming a giant banking institution. That's the real explanation and narrative of the papacy. That's what's really going on. Not the stories of the Pope's planners and their made-up narratives that all contradict. Again, why are they contradicting each other? Is it no change or a change? Which of the pope, which of the pope explainers is the correct interpreter of the interpreters? You see, how do we need a pope explainer for the pope explainers for the pope explainers? How many levels removed do we need to be before we can get an accurate interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation? Remember the video that I made six years ago? Six years ago laughing and making fun of the interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation. What do we have? The very thing I put in my damn video. That's what we have. Let me find my video and see if we're not vindicated. Remember my video? The papacy is circular. And by the way, just a little uh, note for the Roman Catholic pop apologists. I have had an influx, a mountain of people saying, even salty Roman Catholics admitting it, you were right, I'm sorry. There have been a mountain of people saying, I am leaving Rome and I'm going to look into orthodoxy or become orthodox. An avalanche is coming and it's only going to get bigger. And as I told you guys before, it's not going to work to say, well, he's mean. I mean, I tried to tell you guys like three or four years ago when we were already seeing thousands of people convert to orthodoxy. I was already trying to tell you guys then that it's not going to work to just keep saying Jay's mean, Jay's mean, Jay's mean. Jay's, that's all, all they've had is personal attacks and Michael Lofton's low tier five hour boring ass streams that nobody can make it all the way through. So, <clears throat> what did I say? Having spent 10 years Let's see. Rome, I know how it works and I can attest to that fact. Because as soon as you start trying to figure out who's interpreting the popes or the councils correctly in Rome, there's a million different debates and nobody can know. Nobody can decide for sure. And it doesn't matter how many times the pope reaffirms something. Uh, what have we seen in the last few months? What have we seen in the last few months? This is my video from five years ago. So who are we supposed to listen to? Tim Gordon, Matt Frad, Carbohydrate Lofton. Like who, who's the correct Pope Splainer that we're all supposed to look to? Because they're all contradicting. Do we look to the Ukrainian Catholic bishops? Do we look to James Martin? I thought we were supposed to look to Francis. But, oh, that doesn't work, does it? Now we're in the position of interpreting the interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation. And then I did this in the video. I drew Father Bruce. Father Bruce is the one that really interprets Francis, not Michael Lofton. It's Father Bruce. Come to the guitar math, by the way. Make sure. I was getting some feedback there. I had to fix that. So here's our little Pope figure. And here's little, we're going to put little lowly, normie Roman Catholic guy here. Now, a Pope figure des decides one day that it is time for an infallible declaration. Now, he doesn't just simply cite in the document that it is infallible, which would make it pretty easy for everybody, wouldn't know. What he does is he says that with full apostolic authority. Uh, from By the way, <clears throat> that is actually, I think, a good question to keep asking. Why don't they conveniently identify for everyone when this is infallible? I mean, perhaps they could actually just say, this is ex cathedra infallible teaching. But have they ever given us an actual list of infallible ex cathedra teaching? No, they haven't. Which, wouldn't that make it a lot easier if you were the supreme pastor? Maybe the supreme pastor could give us a list of the infallible teachings. Remember, they always ask us this. Where, where the Orthodox list of the infallible things? Where did the list of the infallible things? Yeah, where's the list of the infallible papal things? Oh, there's not one. Oh, wait a minute. Is it is it this book? No, it's not just this book. Uh-oh. Dang. See, I thought I could just read Denzinger. No, sorry. Got to read a lot more than that. 
because there's also these ecumenical councils in Vatican II and all. See that? That's also part of it. Where did you list to the infallible things? The chair, right? Here, he's going to be proclaiming it in his proclamation bubble. Uh, I decree blah, 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 blah. And then later he issues an encyclical that helps interpret this. And then later there's, I don't know, another, uh, the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issues a proclamation that helps interpret this. And then later there's another, I don't know, papal whatever. It doesn't matter. You just keep, come up with all the different layers and levels. Uh, PC, papal, claim, clarification. Papal, claim, clarification. Now, let's say this is how Roman Catholicism works. I'm not, I'm not joking, right? This is really how it works. Okay. Now, what is, what is necessary for something to be ex cathedra from the chair? Well, it's for the whole universal church is proclaimed with full apostolic authority, right? From the chair. And supposedly our, I'll put a inverted cross on him here since they, they love those inverted crosses in Rome. Just beats chair proclamation XXXX, which is also clarified in encyclical uh, BCD, which is also clarified by the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith with Ratzinger as its head, supposedly years, years ago. ago with with also now you notice what I was doing <coughs> in this video, ironically, is the very thing that's happened now, right? We didn't get an ex cathedra statement from Francis about butt stuff, but um, we got multiple statements from Francis which have then become a devolving, kicking the can down the road operation of the new document that interprets the dubia, which interprets the previous statements of Francis, which relates to the previous CDF documents from 2021, which relates to the previous CDF documents from 20, 2003. So you, do you see the, the spiraling out of control that's going on here? That's what I was illustrating in this video from five years ago, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Because this is how Roman Catholicism works. You can see I drew it on the famous whiteboard right there for you. Look, what I drew five years ago on the whiteboard is happening in live time for you. And is it working? Is it providing clarity, unity, certitude, preservation of faith and morals? Is it? Come on. And you all know the answer to that question except for the lying joker in the chat who said that couples is a neutral term, just made up, just pulled that out of his butt. Couples is a neutral term. It doesn't make any sense. Couples is a neutral term. But I mean, I guess if we're going to use QuickBooks to prove the papacy, then that's where we're at, right? I mean, we're at QuickBooks level arguments for the papacy. Then uh, the papal clarification that comes later down the road. And here's you, lowly little Roman guy, and you think we just need the Pope to solve these, these questions of theology. It solves it, does it really? But see, we, what we've already done is we've introduced the mysterious chair of authority that isn't always made clear when, and yes, Roman Catholics will debate ad nauseum which statements are ex cathedra and which ones aren't, which, which shows, shows us that where's the ex cathedra list of the ex cathedra statements roman catholics i mean that's what you should have if your system if you want me to buy into your system at least give me that oh it doesn't exist and it never will this, this whole, whole nonsense, nonsense doesn't, doesn't really do anything like it's supposed to it doesn't solve the problems it's supposed to if we're all sitting around for decades debating which ones are the ex cathedra pronouncements that's because it just moves the problem back a step can you not see that so here's Lola. Can you not see it five years later, six years later with it in front of your face in real time? Can you guys not see this? The, everything I was telling you five years ago is happening in live time for you now. You're Roman Catholic. Catholic. No one sees it. He says, says, all right, I'm going to interpret, interpret this. this. So in his mind. And by the way, think about all the Orthodox ecumenists who want to join with Rome. <laughs> what does it say? All those goobers have just as much egg on their face too, right? And this is, by the way, I think deep secretly, they're all a bunch of, they're, they're into the, uh, the Skittles, uh, you know, touching PPs thing too. So that's, that's what they want deep down. And I say, go for it, go to Rome. You don't need to join the Orthodox church to that. You can just go have that, go have that over there. He's, He's got, got to, to be, be sure, sure 
that the improper interpretation of all this layers of gobbledygook is proper properly entering into his mind and interpreted correctly now guess what every roman catholic will tell you to do in this process oh you can't just do this this is kind of oh, this is kind of protestant bro it's kind of protestant going directly to these papal pro proclamations assuming, assuming that you, that you can, can figure, figure this, this out. out yeah right like in the roman catholic system can I, I thought i could just go read francis's statements and that made it clear right and that's his that's the point of the papacy that these Pope sellers, these car salesmen of the papacy have been selling us. Ah, ha, ha, Orthodox don't have it. We got the goods. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, okay. So now that I'm Roman Catholic, as these goofuses have been themselves saying, I can just read Francis, right? Oh, but wait a minute. Now the whole church is in an uproar trying to figure out what Francis meant. So who's right? Oh, well, you see, now you need to go to uh, Pope Splainer, Dr. So-and-so. Pope Splainer XYZ. So the very thing that you bought into the system for doesn't actually work, as I told you years ago. Oh, oh because I bought into the same thing years ago, back in 2003. I fell for these dumb arguments. I didn't fall for the QuickBooks papacy argument, but I fell for the other arguments back in 2003. Also, also need, need to, to before, before you can, can do, do that, that, you need to go talk to your local priest because your priest is there, Father So-and-so, Father Brute, Father Brith. Father, Father Brith, Father Brith is there for you. Yeah, so where do I get the authoritative, correct interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation? Do you not see now why I took the entire debate with Trent to epistemology? This is why I made the debate about epistemology. And Trent miserably failed in the debate to anybody who knows anything about epistemology, as they can see clearly. Do you understand that not a one of them has yet even grasped or grasped or replied to this epistemic objection because they can't because they're wedded to a foundationalist epistemology which will never allow them to answer this question there we go all right enough of this right i don't have to hey, you want to go watch this uh old carb bloated version of me you can do it right here that was pre-chalk by the way pre-chalk listen you want to get un carb bloated like me that but before i was on chalk and you're like why are you so agitated and up and, and uppity today because of chalk.com baby i took my chalk i did i put a i took a big old hefty dose of a tongue cat so i took my tongue cat of lee and it worked so i'm fired up you too could get fired up by boosting your testosterone by going over to Chalk.com and using the promo code JFE to this JAY50, JAY50 to get 50% off these beloved, wonderful chalk products. Don't forget the Chad mode, the Alpha Chad. Listen, I played the Chad mode ad so many times. I'm just going to, I'm going to take a brief break from it because it's funny. But look, how can you not buy a product with the Chad meme dude on it, right? But as you know, my favorite is the Tonka Lee. And right now, Chalk has that amazing stack wherein you can get both the Action 2.0 and the Tonka Ali and the Chad mode all together. And you still get 50% off using the promo code J50. Also, the promo code J53LIFE, that's J-A-Y-5-3-L-I-F-E. That gets you 53% off all recurring subscriptions. And you might as well set up a recurring subscription because I know you're going to want it when you get these excellent products coming to you in the mail just like Jeffrey Bazos has over on Amazon, you don't have to put all your information back in there. Just get it on recurring subscriptions. Listen, dog. Chalk.com will not make you charitable and it will not make you nuanced. How's that for a selling point? Boom! All right, so we went through this one. We went through this. Now, listen. Tim was so... This was actually genius. Tim actually broke down the grammar for you slow boys. And I don't even remember my grammars. Right? I don't remember freaking grammar. But Tim, because he homeschools, he remembers grammar. And he breaks down the grammar of what it actually means, especially the joker over there talking about neutral terms. No, the word couples is the word used in the document on purpose. And would you like a grammatical breakdown? October the 9th, 
I played you the clip. I told you so then. He's going to do the same thing, create this false middle category that's really meant to be that which is proscribed. Blessings. Women deacons. He's going to do that later in the year. And so I, I have a few things I, I want to do really quickly. I'm playing this now, because I thought it was funny. This is like, just to understand. you need people to break the grammar down for you as to what the sentence means. If you're being lied to or gaslit. In 2021, Cardinal Ladaria, the doctrinal chief at the time, who got fired, it is whispered, for this document, for this defense of teaching, for censuring Fernandez and especially Heiner Wilmer, the two CDF replacements that Francis tried immediately afterwards. This is the document in 2021. It is not licit to impart a blessing on relationships or partnerships. partnerships. He's talking about the document right here. That involve sexual activity outside marriage, as is the case of the unions between persons of the same sex. This is not civil unions, just any relationships partnerships unions three three synonyms for couple it is not listed to impart a blessing on any relationships or partnerships involving sexual activity outside marriage is this the case of the unions between persons of the same sex that's 2021 if your lying friends tell you no change here's the document in 2023 from december the 18th within the horizon outlined here appears the possibility of blessings for couples in irregular situations and for couples of the same sex. 2021, it is not listed to impart a blessing on dot, 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 uh, relationships, partnerships, unions between persons of the same sex, any of those three. 2023, one more time. This is an Ed Phaser quote who's been great on this. The possibility of blessings for couples of the same sex. Those are dense quotes. From 21 and 23. This is a reversal of doctrine. This is formal heresy. There's no question about it. The text is that clear. 2021, 20, 2023. And I, I even, because I'm a grammar master, I even diagrammed the sentence for you. Paragraph 31 of Fiducia Supplic Supplicans. The, uh... Here appears the possibility yeah. of blessings. Grammar is mean, exactly. Of the same sex. Mean yeah. grammar. So here we have it. This is Western we, cis uh, oppressive grammar. Get this. Is this clear? Um, you're gonna have to bring it close. There we go. So. Let me get the L back. Sorry. Uh, who championed the whiteboard? Who championed the whiteboard? Who championed the white? Let's let's let everyone see this. Okay. So what we have, and this is also a free homeschooling lesson because I told you the main thing your grammar school age ki children need to be doing, 90% of their day should be grammar. Here appears, here is the subject of a sentence, appears is the verb, the possibility. Then we have a bunch, uh, possibility is either a direct object or a predicate nominative, depending on how you qualify appears, which is a Unique kind of verb that can either count as an action. So listen, dumb Roman Catholics. Here's a smart Roman Catholic breaking down grammar for you because you can't read. That's why we're doing this. Verb, which takes a direct object noun on the other side, or a linking verb, which takes a predicate nominative noun on the other side. This is a vague sentence. Appears can be one of those rare verbs that's like is or becomes. There aren't, there aren't that many linking verbs. So the possibility is either the direct object receiving the action or more likely it's a linking verb appears and possibility is the renaming of the subject, the predicate nominative. So what appears is the possibility. That's why I like this sentence as a linking verb sentence. Now, of blessings for couples of the same sex, these are three prepositional phrases. The first is... Uh, of blessings is an adjectival phrase. Of blessings describes possibility. The predicate nominative. I mean, imagine how dumb this actually is. That we're having to use grammar to break down the sentences for people 
in the Roman Catholic documents. I mean, just, just stop for a moment and think about the absurdity of this. Supposedly, Francis was going to be the thing that would give us certitude, clarity in doctrine. But we need Roman Catholic apologists, which I'm glad he did this. I'm not dissing Tim. But it illustrates the absurdity of the notion that this doc, that Francis is giving anybody any clarity. Now we got to have Roman Catholic apologists doing grammar to show people what the freaking grammar actually says, dude. Come on. Four couples is an adverbial prep phrase describing an adjectival prep phrase, the one of blessings, and of the same sex describes couples, meaning it is another, uh, what kind of couples? Couples of the same sex. So it's another adjectival prep phrase. Obviously. Oh, prep phrases are almost always adverbial or adjectival. They act just like an adverb or an adjective. What means, what this all means is that what appears here. What mean this? Is existing here is a possibility. What mean this? This mean. <laughs> all right. All right. <clears throat> I mean, if you don't get it after this point, then just go some go to some other channel, man. Roman Catholics in the chat, mad, butthurt. Just go somewhere else. Like, we're done. That's it. There's nothing else I have to say to you. You don't like me, we're good. That's fine. Go for it. Go go have uh, Purple Source Rex and Donuts with Michael Lofton all day long. Let's open up the chat. We got a few people here requesting to fuss. Cozy Kevin. What's up, Kevin? You gotta unmute, dude. Are you gonna unmute? <laughs> Guess not. Bones, what's up? Uh oh, the Roman Baron. Uh oh. That sounds like a Roman Catholic. Go set it straight. You gotta unmute. Howdy, can you hear me? Yo. Yes. Christ is born. Um, I just wanted to say um, I'm a former Roman Catholic, and as soon as I saw this, um, I read the entire document because I knew people would just be, read the document. No, 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 you haven't read the document. Well, I read the document, and I'm not retarded. And it says to bless sodomy. I just, you know, I don't understand how Catholics can't read that in plain language. And called I, lying. I really, it's called yeah, lying. It's, it, it's lying. <laughs> and doesn't this illustrate, by the way, that evidentialism isn't true? I mean, here's the evidence. How come everybody isn't clearly interpreting the clear meaning of the passage? Right. It, it, it also gives credence to, like, the Western heresy of gradualism. Yeah. Right. And it, it, I mean, it's pretty powerful because I'm suspecting maybe here in a year, it, it will probably be full blown homosexual marriage. Now, that's my schizo theory. But I mean, they did the same thing for, quote, communion in the hand. They did the same thing for, quote, altar women. I well, mean, they have altar girls, which is the preparation for female deacons, deaconesses. Right. Yeah. And that's absolutely. the preparation for female priests. I also saw your show on predictive programming on avoiding Babylon. And this is, in my opinion, like the predictive programming of the Roman see. I mean, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think they throw ideas out to test the waters and see how far they can go. And actually, actually, Tim did an entire stream on incrementalism and he's totally nailed it. He's absolutely spot on. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and if there's any Catholics here who, I mean, are still coping, um, that Catholic whoever that was who completely dismantled the you know the the grammar theory i mean he did such a good job on proving that the document reads in plain english and you know the verbiage used You're is limited. very clear yeah it's tim gordon who's a buddy of ours who uh is basically uh along with avoiding babylon about the only roman catholics that we can still interact with that haven't, we haven't completely uh run off or whatever um so i you know i appreciate them and i like on a personal level tim quite a bit he's a really cool guy we've hung out in person um but there's the full video if you guys want to watch tim's full 
uh, discussion of uh, the the incrementalism that the guy's talking about. So any other points? I appreciate that. Yeah, no, 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 none other. God bless you, man. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, you as well. Uh, Bones. What's up, Bones? I'm you. Hey, Jay. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yes, sir. Um, I just, uh, I, I kind of debate some Roman Catholics online uh, rather frequently, actually. Mm -hmm. And one of their biggest arguments against the Orthodox Church is that it's autocephalous. And they're trying to make autocephaly akin <laughs> to Protestantism. They're trying to be like, oh, you're basically Protestant. Oh, well, that's you're awesome because that's the great, one of the greatest owns that you could ever have. Because they don't even know that autocephalacy comes out of the Council of Ephesus. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's how yeah. dumb they are. They think that that would then mean that the Council of Ephesus taught Protestantism. So that's a great... So they're just elf owning themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah, I always thought that was ridiculous. That, and I also tried to use uh, your argument that I watched in your debate with Nick Fuentes about the Old Testament church as being a decentralized unit and kind of what Christ wanted in the church going forward. And they just, they think that that's ridiculous. They're like, oh, well, there was kings in the Old Testament. I'm like, what? What does that have to do with the Pope? <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, well, they just think just, everything's fulfilled in the Pope because the religion basically is the religion of the Pope. So... Um, <laughs> as uh, you can go read about Council of Ephesus, autocephalacy, autocephaly of the Church of Cyprus was granted at the Third Ecumenical Council of Eph Ephesus. The Jerusalem Church <coughs> was declared a patriarchate and autocephalous at Quintessext, and this is also accepted in the canons of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. So, two ecumenical councils recognize autocephalous churches. And they don't even know that. They're completely ignorant. They, they Because they just think everything is about the Pope. So, yeah. Classic. That's Man. a classic. Well, thanks, oh. Thank you. Um, Jason will be the last one. Then we got to go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I just wanted to ask. So, okay. Have you read that new or maybe it's not so new, but the article of what the, uh, what Bartholomew, the ecumenical patriarch, has been saying about Constantinople? Uh, no, but I'm guessing that he says something about the Constantinople being like a pope. Hello? Are you there? Well, I guess he's gone. Beardy, what's up, Beardy? Last one, we gotta un gotta unmute Beardy. Yeah, thanks for uh, bringing this on. Appreciate it, Jay. Um, yes, sir. I wanted to bring up what Michael Knowles was saying. So he disagrees with you. Um, he says that the the so-called blessing is is outside of the we'll say the the spiritual inner circle of the church and right, well, it's hold outside. on whoa 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 <laughs> outside of the spiritual inner circle okay so well, he didn't use those words i'm sorry i'm paraphrasing um i don't actually re remember exactly what he said but i don't know if you watched his little um blurb on it no i don't keep up with these people uh, i did ask him to debate though and it was all of course ignored Yeah, so I mean, he's basically saying that um, the so so called blessing is for people that are not uh, professing Christians, you know, that aren't part of the Catholic Church. Uh, That's his argument. Total baloney. I think so too. Total baloney, because the same blessing was asked for people in the church in the twenty twenty one document very clearly, and Michael Lofton even pointed out that it was the same question asked. Uh, and by the German bishops who were trying to do blessings of people in the church. Of course, I mean, this is just sophistry that they use because these people um, are salesmen. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, I will give them a point for the creative 
uh, attempts here to, <laughs> to act like to act like these are people quote outside the church. Give me a freaking break. Everybody knows that this is about blessings from the bishops and the priests towards people who will come to the, how many non-Catholic. First of all, it doesn't make any sense anyway that the priest can bless people outside of the church as a same sex couple. That doesn't even make any sense. Secondly, it's not for people outside the church because this is not some giant scandal where millions of gay couples are rushing to Rome to Novus Ordo priest to get blessed outside of the church. Everyone knows this is an attempt to bring in Skittles marriage. It's yeah, clear it's, it's as grooming. that. We'll call it what it is. It's grooming. It's prepping for the next stage because it's incrementalism. So, I mean, that's just, that's just another example of sophistry. But thank you for that. <clears throat> Last one. Uh, we don't really have time for any more. BMX sends 20 bucks. Thank you so much, BMX. Catholic becoming Orthodox. There we go. That's a nice name. One dollar. Robertson Jenna says that the church fathers agreed about a geocentric universe and that, that if you deny it, it leads to a foundation of, ortho, uh, of, of atheism. Does Orthodoxy generally believe in this? Um, I don't think there is any general Orthodox statement on this. I think that you're free to believe either of these positions and I don't have any problems saying, yeah, I'm sure there are good arguments for geocentrism. Uh, St. Herman of Alaska, $10. Jay, I was baptized and received into the church uh, at Nativity. Thank you. Uh, you helped bring me out of atheism and you led me into the church. So thanks. Thank you. Glad to hear that. Uh, Chase Hager, $3. He weighted each piece of evidence in the analysis. Oh, he's, uh, Chase is talking about uh, <laughs> the, the uh, Bayesian uh, QuickBooks. So it was an arbitrary spreadsheet weighted on his presuppositions. Classical foundationalist moment. Exactly. Fumples $3. Honestly, imagine Michael Lofton defending the uh, election of a child pope. Uh, I, he, of course he would, right? So if the Roman college voted and accepted the, the uh, Joffrey as pope, they would, have to, they would have to go with it. Fumples $3. Is there a Bayesian argument for orthodoxy? No. <laughs> but good question. Punky Dennis, $5. Jay, Catholics are always droning on about it only counts if it's ex cathedra. Vatican I teaches that they have to submit to things even outside of ex cathedra. Exactly. It's called ordinary magisterium. So where did this ex cathedra come from? Well, I mean, there is a doctrine that the Pope has the ability to pronounce doctrines ex cathedra if he chooses to. So that's sort of like this thing he has as like his backup, right? But that's for supposedly extreme or extraordinary circumstances. Who even knows when that is? But you see, it's clear. It's it's never laid out as to what the exact instances are. And it's I believe it's left vague on purpose. Because if you leave it vague on purpose, this allows the papacy to have this ultimate kind of bait and switch thing to where it can always be interchangeably dogmatic or not dogmatic as the situation calls for. So if they need to say something retroactively, oh, well, that wasn't a dogmatic definition. Oh, it, does it, it appears to contradict. Oh, well, then you see it wasn't dogmatic. So it's dogmatic when it needs to be, is what that amounts to. So you're absolutely correct. Dr. Vagistel, $1. The Pope consulted the church fathers, and T.D. Jakes and P. Diddy agree with his decree as long as Alexander Soros is officiating the blessings. Another creative attempt to maybe give an account of what's going on. Thank you so much, Dr. Vagisel. Frankie D, $10. So we can all then just go to mosques, bow our head, and say that secretly we're praying to Jesus and not Allah. And if this is the case, then how come all the early Christians didn't do this when they were being martyred? Exactly. Yeah, they, they could have just said, oh, I'm just praying secretly to Jesus, not to Zeus or to the Roman emperor. Yeah, we would have never had any martyrs. Uh, exactly, because everybody knows that this is baloney. Gary, $25. Thank you so much, Gary. Ricky, $5. Pope Slayers will go all the way until they eventually have to defend the blessings of the Skittles marriage. Yeah, and then it'll go on into... I mean, the floodgates have been open. Pandora's box is open. And the area where I disagree with Tim is that Tim thinks that some conservative band of cardinals will be able to like come together maybe and like stop Francis. Uh, I don't think so. Siggy, $5. Catholic, uh, is that Muslim youth marriage, I guess? 
when will that happen? Well, who knows? I guess the floodgates have been open, right? Tag Hua, $3. If there's no definitive, definitive teach, excuse me, if there's no definitive list of infallible teachings, this is illuminating. Creating a document would be too strong of a claim, just like some sort of new biblical revelation. It's better to just have a vague do-it-yourself infallibility. Exactly. That's the point I was just making. Exactly. Thus, Roman Catholics would lack, Roman Catholicism then lacks the courage of its own convictions. Sometimes I'm very bad at reading super chats and I kind of for, I miss stuff. And somebody got mad the other day because I thought I was skipping their super chats. Sometimes I skip them because there's just a small window of what I can see. So if a bunch of them come in at once and you scroll a little bit, it scrolls past a bunch of them. And if somebody walks in or if I get distracted, then I might miss a super chat or I might miss half of it. If it's a long one or something, it's not, I'm not doing it on purpose. Sometimes I'm in a hurry. Sometimes I get distracted. So any people that I've missed your super chats, forgive me. I'm not doing it on purpose. <clears throat> uh, remember you can subscribe and uh, go to the shop of the website, get the books, uh, jasonhouse.com. Um, we have in my big red book, there's actually about, 300 pages critiquing Roman Catholicism. So that's not, I mean, the book's 600 pages, but about two or 300 of it's critiquing Rome, about 200 of it critiquing Protestant stuff, and then geopolitical philosophical essays in the red book. You can get that in the shop at jasonalysis.com, uh, as well as all my other books. And um, be sure and subscribe to Jamie as well. Head on over to Rockfin, uh, all of our great buddies and friends over at rockfin.com. Also, Tristan and I will be streaming this week We've chosen a, an amusing little ditty known as Stepford Wives. We thought that would be a fun feminist film, which oddly has a bunch of MK Ultra stuff in it. You think you're watching some kind of conspiracy MK Ultra thing, and then it turns into this like total feminist propaganda thing. So we will be uh, deconstructing Stepford Wives, the original movie. I don't know if we're going to do that stupid remake one with Ferris Bueller, but. There is the, um, I don't, an AI Pope might actually do better than Francis. People are dissing an AI. I think we make it actually ha should have an, a, uh, an AI Pope. Uh, anyway, subscribe to me over on Rockfin as well as all of our buddies and friends over there. And uh, look for the upcoming stream this week with,